Okay, hi everyone, while we uh, run the slides. Um, so I'll just do a quick introduction uh, from uh, myself and then Jim and people will introduce himself. Uh, my name is Nancy Zemo, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm licensed to practice in Ontario, not here necessarily. However, because CASEL is a federal legislation, um, that's something I can advise anyone in, anywhere in Canada. So that's why I've traveled here all the way from Toronto to your lovely city. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I uh, Just a bit about me, as I mentioned, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I have uh, I was formerly a partner at uh, Miller Thompson, a firm, and recently I've actually left to uh, launch my own practice that uh, focuses on internet law and anti-spam, such as Castle. And I'm being very busy lately, as you can imagine. Um, and, uh, and yes, I'm very happy I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to give you the legal aspects and what uh, we need to know before July 1st, which is very, very soon, um, and particularly with respect to charities and nonprofits. Uh, and uh, before I go ahead, I'm going to hand this over to Jim so he can introduce himself. There you go. Hi, my name is Jim. I, come, I work with MethodWorks Consulting. I am actually based out of Victoria. Um, MethodWorks is based out of Calgary. We have people all across Canada. Um, I've been working in nonprofit data for oh, wow, about 15 years now. Um, I actually have a programming background before that. Um, right now, I specialize in black box products, um, but I've have experience with a number of other platforms as well. So, we'll talk about how how to look at data too, and how to look at CRMs and email systems. Okay, so uh, before we go ahead, and Eli already asked some questions of the, of the audience, and I'm happy he did, so he got the conversation going. But I actually want to see a show of hands and a couple of questions. First of all, who here um, work for or represent uh, or, uh, charities, uh, registered charities? Okay, so registered under the income tax act. All right, so a big portion of you. Are there any of you here who represent nonprofits that are not charities? That are not charities? Registered. Okay, so also a big portion. Anyone here that is not for registered here representing charities or registered? Uh, sorry, NPOs. Yeah. Okay, so others. All right, welcome. Everybody's welcome. Um, uh, so I just wanted to get an idea because uh, our, as you can see, our um, talk today will be about the Canada's anti-spam legislation and how it applies to charities and nonprofits. Uh, of course, uh, if you are a couple of you are not here on behalf of either, it will certainly apply to everybody else as well. And. Uh, and uh, now that I know how many are charities, the other question I have is who here believes that they are exempt from compliant castle? That's okay, you can, if you'd like, okay, well, I'm happy to see that very few uh, hands went up, so that, that, and that means you have, you know that they might apply to you, and it does, so, and I, I assume that's why you're here today. All right, so let's just, uh, I'll give you a quick overview of what we're gonna talk about today. The first uh, thing I will discuss, I'll give you an intro about CASEL, um, just a general overview of what it's about, what it says, um, and then we'll get into detail about the commercial electronic messages component of CASEL, or CDMs. We will then talk about um, CASEL compliance, how you can comply with CASEL. Uh, we will talk about the exemptions to the CDM requirements, and finally at the end we'll give you tips for, for preparing for CASEL both on the legal side and on the, on the IT side. So, CASEL. So first of all, um, what is uh, Canada's anti-spam legislation? Uh, it's a legislation that was passed by uh, the Canadian government in uh, 2010, so it's been around since 2010. However, its main provisions are coming into force July 1st, 2014, so very, very soon. In 2010, when it was passed, it was drafted in a very broad way. And so, and what the government did is that it said, okay, well then now we've sort of drafted these very broad provisions and we're going to then send it now to the, to the um, uh, various regulators as well as Industry Canada to then uh, meet with uh, representatives of various industries, get their input, and see how we can tailor the legislation to work for various industries. And one of the industries that was very vocal was the charities and nonprofit industry. Uh, everybody was lobbying for exemptions. And what we got after it took them three and a half years. So three and a half years it took, it took them to come up with the regulations that we have today. And that's what we're going to talk about. Now, the reason I have this uh, particular cartoon is because 
The real issue with regard to the castle is, and what came up in 2010 and still the, the issue today, is what is spam, right? Canada's anti-spam legislation. Now, just to step back, Canada's anti-spam legislation is actually not the real name or the, the legal name of legislation. It's a, it's a, that is sort of a title that was given to it by someone. Personally, I don't think it's uh, very helpful. It, it's quite misleading because, as you will hear, Canada's anti-spam legislation, or CASEL, uh, doesn't just regulate spam. It regulates much more than that. And that being said, what is spam? Well, the government thought about it and said, well, you know, it's hard to determine is spam that email you get from the Nigerian prince asking you to invest in his fantastic scheme, or is it the email you get from your uh, uh, local electronics store from which you bought a product uh, three years ago and it's telling you about their, their great new product that came out or great uh, sales, or perhaps from the charity you donated to five years ago that is sending you their newsletters every week asking for donations. What is spam? And the government said, you know what, we don't want to deal with figuring out which one, which of those emails is spam and which one is it. We're, we're just going to say it's all spam and we're just going to regulate everything. And that was their solution, regulate everyone. So basically what Castle does is regulates all commercial electronic messages, not spam, commercial <coughs> electronic messages or CEMs sent or accessed by a computer in Canada. That goes to your question right there, oh, Rob. Yeah. CASEL will regulate it. I'll get into it a little bit in detail, but you were asking about how it applies to, people, to um, foreign, uh, either people from uh, foreign companies sending emails to Canada or from Canada to the US, for example. So it, it regulates any commercial electronic message that is sent from a computer to Canada or accessed by a computer in Canada. Okay. And it also regulates a broad range of other types of online or electronic. Uh, activities such as the installation of computer programs, misleading advertising and marketing uh, uh, activities online, privacy invasion through your computer, and collection of email addresses without consent, which, which is often referred to as email harvesting. And there are two underlying principles with regard to CASEL. When you think about CASEL and how you're going to deal with it, how you're going to Apply, apply it within your organization, you really have to come back to these two principles. The first principle is all the regulated activities have to be carried out with informed consent. And what is informed consent? It's an opt-in regime, okay? Nothing can be done unless the person on the receiving end of that email, of the text, of whatever it is you're sending out or you're doing, has already given you informed consent. So they've consented and they understood what they were consented to. Consenting to. The other thing that the other part of uh, Castle, the under underlying principle, is that nothing can be done without clearly identifying the person that is conducting or sending the message or is doing the activity. So there has to be clear identification of the sender, and there has to be informed consent by the recipient. And that's really what you have to think about when you think about Castle. <coughs> well. Once they pass this legislation, they pass the regulations three and a half years later. The other thing they've done um, is that they uh, they decided they want to make sure that Castle is accessible, available to anyone out, out there who wishes to complain. If they wanted to make it as easy as possible to start a complaint process. In other words, they don't. If, as, as, as the less bureaucracy, the better. And so. Uh, what the government has done is they've created this website called, uh, well, fightspam.gc.ca. It's already live, although complaints won't be processed until July 1st, 2014. But in any event, it's already there. It's um, managed by the CRTC, which is one of the regulators. And anyone who is, feels that they've been uh, on the receiving end of a violation of CASEL, so someone who received an email, can go to this website, type in whatever they need, the information, and that starts the complaint process. So pretty easy. Don't have to go and fill out forms. And file them with a particular government bureaucrat. The other thing they've done to make sure that this legislation is taken seriously, so they made it accessible, they've also made, wanted to get a buy-in by basically anyone out there to make sure everybody complies. And so they've created significant consequences for non-compliance. And that's probably why most of you are here, I'm sure some of you or most of you have heard the type of penalties that have been set up by the government for non-compliance. 
and that's what they call the bio. They want to make sure there's a bio. So there could be up to fines or administrative monetary penalties, as the government calls it, not fines, um, up to $1 million per individual per violation. That's an email, one email, okay? Uh, and up to $10 million per organization per violation. So that's the highest end. Obviously, it's a sliding scale and it's up, and it's really up to the government to figure out how, how they want to apply that number. But based on what the CRPC has been saying, again, we're uh, one of the bodies that will be regulating this, they've been saying that they don't really have any particular um, approach to how much they're going to, um, how much they're going to, there's no, there's no like, idea of, well, we're going to start small and we're going to increase as per violation. If someone does it once, we're going to give them only $100 and then it's again. They just say, we can go right away and go all the way up if we want to. Give you the one million if we feel like, it, if we feel it's serious enough. So it's, it's, it's more of their it's subjective on their end. The other thing they've done uh, under Castle is they've created private rights of action. So first of all, just to go back again, the administrative monetary penalties or the fines are the uh, consequences for non-compliance that are uh, going to be imposed by the government, by the regulators, okay? Um, similar to fines you receive for various other types of violations, uh, bylaws, etc. In addition to that, under Castle, they've created the private rights of action. What are those? Well, those are basically civil lawsuits. So what Castle says is anyone who is on the receiving end of a violation of Castle, or receiving end of an email, for example, can sue in court civilly for that violation. And when you think about one email that goes out, email blast that goes out to, let's say, 5,000 people, uh, that at that point creates what, you know, we are, what you would assume would be class actions, and that's probably pretty much what it is. You know, one email can create a massive class action. So the type of potential damages are very significant. What's the basis for establishing damage? Violating Castle. We'll talk about what it is in a minute. Violating Castle? You violate Castle, you can be liable for. Uh, administrative monetary penalty penalties to the government, and uh, for uh, being sued, uh, liability, civil liability. Same thing. We'll talk about what, 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 you, what is violation, what, what constitutes violation of capital, but once you do that, then you're just exposed to either one or, either or both of those. In addition to that, again, the buy-in, and I, I've heard the CRTC say that, um, if you go actually, they, there's, a, there's a video that they put on YouTube recently, the CRTC, talking about their approach the castle and they talk about buy-in often. And what they said is, well, we want to make sure that the organizations and the corporate, you know, corporate organizations can't uh, hide behind the corporate veil. So we are going to do two things. The castle, what castle did is that it created, you know, they want to pierce the corporate veil, made it easy to uh, go after the, the people at the top. So they created vicarious liability of the, corp the organization for employees' actions. So one employee's email would basically cause, would, may cause the organization or the corporation to be liable. In addition to the fact that they have also created personal liability for officers and directors. So if you are an executive director, that would be that, an officer. If you are sitting on the board of director of a, of a charity, for example, um, that, would, uh, that would apply to you as well. Regulating bodies. Okay, so I mentioned the CRTC before. Why did I mention them? Well, because there are three <coughs> bodies that have been tasked with regulating CASEL. That's how uh, broad CASEL is. Okay, the CRTC is one of them. Right? So the CRTC is the main one, and what they are going to be tasked with is regulating the commercial electronic messages component for CNs. Again, we'll talk about that shortly. And the installation of computer programs, which we won't cover today. I'll very, very briefly cover at the end so you know what that is. But um, that's a se another section of CASEL that comes into force in January 2015. The Privacy Commissioner has also been tasked with uh, uh, regulating Castle, uh, and she, or he, um, now it's he, um, the, his office is tasked with the collection, the, sorry, the regulating of collection of personal information and address harvesting. And finally, the Com Competition Bureau has been tasked with regulating the online advertising and misleading advertising and marketing. And why those three, I mentioned the three is because um, it, the way the enforcement and regulatory regime has been set up is that they're kind of talking to each other. So they're going to be keeping each other um, uh, abreast of you know, the various violations. Because one violation, for example, may, 
may involve the CRTC because it's an email blast that was sent to uh, a thousand people, but it may also involve the Privacy Commissioner because those email addresses were obtained through email harvesting, uh, which uh, I'm not uh, just. I will talk about email harvesting quickly at the end, but basically what email harvesting is, if you don't know, it's a uh, code that reads emails out there online, just you know, collects emails and then uses those to send emails to them. Email addresses and then just uses those to target people and send them emails. Okay, so basically email harvesting is getting your email address without your consent. Dates to know. All right, so July 1st, 2014, very soon. That is the main date that you need to keep in mind right now, um, and that is the, when the requirements regarding commercial electronic messages come into force. That means that as of July 1st, 2014, two weeks from now, not even two, actually it is exactly two weeks, two weeks from now, uh, you, you, anyone can be uh, um, facing an administrative monetary penalty, we talked about earlier, fines. For violations of castle. January 15, 2015, that's the next date to keep in mind. That's when the requirements regarding installation of computer programs comes into play. I mentioned that, as I said, I'm not going to get into that in detail today because we're here to talk about July 1st right now. And finally, the other date to keep in mind, and I'm going to get back to that later in detail, but it's an important date for two reasons, is July 1st, 2017. It's important because, remember I mentioned earlier the private rights of action and civil lawsuits. So, uh, that's the date when the private rights of actions co are uh, coming to force. As I said earlier, there are two potential type of consequences. The first consequence is administrative monetary penalties or fines by the government. That can happen anytime after July 1st, 2014. The civil lawsuits in court, the private rights of actions, the class actions, that doesn't come into play until July 1st, 2017. We got a reprieve of three years, you know, we can't, no one can sue us for three years. But after that date, we, they can, we can be sued. The other reason July 1st, 2017 is important, it's the end of the transition period for implied consent. I'm going to get into that in detail later because it applies to pretty much everybody in this room. But what's important to keep in mind is there's a misconception out there that I come, uh, come across regularly when uh, working with people about CASEL. There is a belief or a misunderstanding that there is a grace period of three years, people refer to it as a grace period, of three years uh, with regard to, to the enforcement of CASEL. That is incorrect. There is no grace period. Keep that in mind. CASEL comes into force July 1st, 2014. The CEF component, the Commercial Electronic Message component, comes into force July 1st, 2014. From that moment on, it will be enforced and regulated by the CRTC. All right, so commercial, that's the general review of CASEL. Now, before I go ahead, I forgot to mention in the beginning, and I should have, uh, I expect you guys to all have questions, or most of you to have questions. We always get lots of questions, and Jim and I are here to answer your questions, and we will do our best to answer them. But because of the time, and there, we have a lot to cover, we're going to leave those, if, you, if we ask if you could just leave those questions to the end, and then we're going to have a Q&A uh, time, and also if you want to come over at, at the break, I'm happy to take questions as well. But just, you know, if you have questions, put them down, write them down, or just, you know, and then I'm happy to take your questions at the end, okay? Alright, so, commercial electronic messages. That's what we want to talk about today, and that's what, what basically all of you are here to, to hear about. CMs, what are they? Well, a commercial electronic message, or CM, is a message sent by any electronic means. Okay, so it could be an email, that's the most common, obviously. An SMS, text message, an instant message, uh, it says social media, but that's, for example, a tweet or, or an in-mail through LinkedIn, that has, as its purpose, this is the key word, as its purpose, or one of its purposes, to encourage participation in commercial activity. Okay, and when we talk about one of its purposes, the way uh, the regulators have been um, indicating that they, are, they intend to uh, uh, interpret this particular definition, and the way that they're going to apply it, is that all you have to do is have something in your message, a word, a link, Anything in it could be a, again it could be a hyperlink to a website. Uh, that that all it has to do is promote or encourage 
participation in a commercial activity, and we'll talk about what commercial activity is under the definition in a second. But all you got to do is have something in it, a one word, two word that says, you know, click here to do X or click here to promote, and you're promoting an organization. And all you have to do is to promote an organization or a, or a person that is also involved in commercial activity to turn it into a CM. Okay, so it's very broad. Now let's talk about what commercial activity means. Because that's really the second part of the definition. Well, commercial activity is any particular transaction, act, or conduct. So notice it does not have to be a transaction. When we think about commercial activities, often people assume that that means there's some exchange of money, uh, exchange of something, right? No, it's not just a transaction. There doesn't have to be a transaction. It's an act or conduct that that is of a commercial character. So it's sort of a circular definition, which is why there's a lot of confusion. I, I, I believe that the woman over there, I don't have your name, was saying that you're, you're having trouble understanding what a commercial activity is, a uh, commercial uh, electronic messages. You, along with everybody else, have that problem because of the circular definition. It's commercial activity is basically something of commercial character. What is commercial? Um, but here, here are the key words and why you are all here in this room today. What it goes on to say is whether or not the person who carries it out does so in the expectation of profit. And I highlighted those words because what those words do is they turn this definition to apply to electronic messages sent by nonprofits. Okay? Because it does not have to be an expectation of profit. Charities and nonprofits would be, a, basically it would be essentially any electronic message sent by a charity or nonprofit that has some form of a commercial, something in it that encourages participation in commercial activity or has a commercial character. And I'm going to go ahead and give you some examples of what I would consider to be uh, the types of CMs sent by charities. Very few examples of types of CMs sent by charities and nonprofits. <clears throat> this is not an exhaustive list by any means. So the first one is email appeals for donations. Definitely CMs. So what you're doing is you're asking for money. Money is commercial in character. And there does not have to be an expectation of profit. Email uh, invitations to events. So if you're inviting someone to an event where you're going to be raising funds or anything promoting the organization or there's some kind of money exchange, that would be a, a CM. Promotional emails. If you're promoting an event or a lottery promotions, again, there's going to be some exchange of funds or not even an exchange, but there'll be something of money, of some, something commercial about, it, about the event, uh, then it's going to be a CM. Emails promoting a charitable event or activity if those activities are of a commercial character, yeah, what's commercial? It's got to be something commercial about it. Uh, electronic newsletters. We got, I got that question in the beginning. I always get that question. Your e-newsletters, okay, well, here's, I, I'm not going to say all of them are going to be CMs because there are times and possibilities where your e-newsletters will not be CM. If they are purely informational and there is nothing in them other than educational, it's educating someone about some cause or information, you're giving, you're teaching them something, whatever it is, you're providing pure information, factual information, nothing commercial about it, there's no link in it that says to donate to us or find out more, click here, then it's possible that those e-newsletters will not be CMs. But often, newsletters sent by charities and nonprofits have something more than just pure information, right? They're, got, they're there to educate and to inform people about your, your organization and your activities, but they're also to raise funds. So, I always say, or a sign of caution, assume your email newsletters are or, or CMs, okay? Emails promoting the organization, if the organization's activities are of a commercial character, again, so you're promoting your organization, but the organization has to be have some activity that's commercial in nature. If you're a charity, you will always have some com type form of commercial activity because you're going to be raising funds, right? That's commercial. Right, so those are CEMs in general. That's the definition. Now we'll talk about, well, now that, well, let me step, step back for a second. What does that mean? Well, it means is if you are a charity and you, or you're an, an, a nonprofit organization, at some point, sometime, you will be sending out a commercial electronic message. It doesn't mean that all your electronic messages are commercial, are going to be CMs. But you will have, at some point, you're going to be sending a CM, even if it's one. So what are your requirements regarding CMs? Okay, well, here are the requirements. What do you have to do to comply with Castle? Castle said that you are prohibited, remember I said it was an opt-in regime, so you are prohibited 
from sending a CEM to an electronic address unless the recipient has already consented to receive the CEM, has already consented. You need to have consent first before you send that CEM. And the CEM contains specific prescribed information. I'll tell you about what those, I'm going to break those down in a second. But those are the two requirements, consent, information. Okay? And with regards to consent, well, the Act says there are two types of consent. There's express consent, implied consent. We're going to also, I'm going to talk about each one of those in detail in a, sec in a few seconds. But keep in mind that the Act says the onus is on the sender to prove consent. We, I write provide documentation to, to prove consent because, well, I, 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 I'm also a litigator, so I can say you don't necessarily have to have it in writing. You can always testify in court under oath that someone has given you consent, but as between something in writing and as between your testimony, the writing is always just much easier. Okay, so that's why to provide documentation. So while the castle doesn't say you have to provide documentation, that is my little uh, uh, suggestion regarding compliance. So you need to prove consent. Providing documentation to prove consent is one of the things you should be considered thinking about. All right, so before I go ahead uh, to implied consent, so I mentioned two things. There's, there's two types of consent, implied consent, express consent. We're going to start with the implied consent. And implied consent under CASEL, and I, before I talk about this, this is uh, um, the, the types that appear on this particular, uh, just go back for one second. Uh, on, on, on this slide. Implied consent under, under Kessel is not the same as implied consent under the privacy legislation that most of you would be familiar with. And you have to keep that in mind, and you've got to make a switch in your head. Of, I, I, again, I advise a lot of nonprofits and charities, and I constantly have to get them to, re, to, to get that understanding, to separate the understanding of how they understand implied consent under privacy legislation and how they understand implied consent under Kessel. In, under Kessel, there are basically four types of implied consent. If you don't meet one of those four types of implied consent, you don't have implied consent. It's not, I, I, now again, I know BC has its own privacy legislation, but for example, under PIPEDA, which is the federal privacy legislation, which is what we adhere to in Ontario, their implied consent can be implied from the circumstances. So it's more fluid. It's not, it's, it's an objective test. It's based on how the person behaved. If someone gave you an email, if someone gave you information, it's implied, that kind of stuff. Under Castle, that's not the case. If someone gave you an email, it doesn't mean you have implied consent. Implied consent is based on specific requirements. If you don't meet those specific requirements, you don't have implied consent. So in a way, it makes it easier to think about it because it's just like, okay, one, two, three, does it meet these three requirements? No, okay, I don't have implied consent. You can sort of uh, as a lawyer, at least, it makes it easier for us to think, to think it through. On your end, on the other hand, if you're trying to be creative to, to figure out whether or not you implied consent, you can't. There's no creativity around implied consent in the castle. It either it is or it isn't. Okay? So, now we'll talk about the four requirements regarding implied consent. The four types, sorry. The four types of implied consent. The first type of implied consent that you will have, or you can have, is when the recipient of your CEM has conspicuously published his or her electronic address. So for example, I give on a website. I, as a, on this particular situation, I always give myself. I have a website, I have my bio up there, I have my email up there. So I can conspicuously publish my email account, address, okay? That's the first requirement. That recipient has not indicated a desire not to receive unsolicited CF. So next to my email, I don't send, I don't say in black and white, please don't send me unsolicited electronic messages. Okay? If it doesn't say that, you're already, you've already met the first, second, the second part of that, of that test. And finally, and this is the, the key, the message is relevant to the recipient's business role, duties, or functions. So in my example, you have applied consent to send me electronic messages only if those electronic messages relate to my business as a lawyer, okay? But if they relate to something else, you do not have applied consent to send me an email, even though I put my email address up there, okay? So that's under this particular requirement. Second, so that's the first type of applied consent. If you have that applied consent, then it's indefinite. There's no time on it, on it, 
as long, until, as long as my email is published or until I say don't send me anything, you have applied consent to send me electronic messages. That relates to my duty as, as a lawyer or the recipient's duties in whatever they do. The second type of, type of applied consent is similar but a bit different, okay? It's a, it's, it's a similar concept. It's when the recipient has disclosed to you his or her electronic address without indicating a wish not to receive electronic messages. As an example, I call this the business card example. You're at the meeting today, someone comes up to you and says, here's my, here's my business card. There's an email address on, on the business card. At that point, they've, cons they've, um, they've disclosed to you their electronic address. So that's the example. But you will only have applied consent to send them electronic messages if the message is relevant to their business role, duties, or functions. Again, so it's the same idea as the if they published it. You can only send them an electronic message if it has to do with their business. So if I'm a lawyer, I give you my card, you can send me emails to, uh, about my work as a lawyer. Okay? Those are the two kinds of applied consent that are indefinite. There's another type, of, remember I said there were four. The third type of applied consent, the one that I believe a lot of charities and nonprofits will be relying on, and you should be relying on it. So, this is called the non business relationship, implied consent based on non, an existing non business relationship. What it says is if you are a registered charity under the Income Tax Act, you have implied consent to send CEMs to anyone who has donated to you or volunteered with you in the past two years, in the two years before you send the electronic message, okay? Alternatively, if you're a nonprofit organization that is not a registered charity, a registered charity under the Act, so that, this is really the only, the only part of the Act that applies to NPOs specifically, um, if you're a nonprofit organization, you have implied consent to send CEMs to anyone who has been a member of yours in the past two years, in the two years before you send that electronic message. Right? So as long as they're, as long as they're a member, an existing member under, the, under your bylaws, you can send them electronic messages for two years. Remember, it's these particular types of, it, this particular type of implied consent, the non-business relationship, is a definite time, two-year period. Yes. One clarification on Yes, clarification, that's fine. Yes, yes, yes. No, so fine. the first two are, there's the extra bit that you can send them, if they've given you, if you found the address, the pen your card, but it's also relevant to the business. Yeah. With these ones, if they remember, it, does, it doesn't, you can send doesn't, them whatever, theory, anything, anything. Anything, exactly. Okay. This one is based on the relationship. The other, the first two are based on the person's business. Good, that's a good point. This one is based purely on your relationship with the recipient, okay? So again, if you have a, so if you're a registered charity, you have implied consent for two years to send electronic messages to your donors and volunteers. If you're a nonprofit organization, you have two years to send NCMs to your members, okay? Finally, the last, the fourth part of the type of, uh, um, implied consent, which flows, is similar to the, not, to the one we just talked about, the non-business relationship, except this one is called an existing business relationship, okay, quite similar to the, other, to the one we just talked about. What it says is, you have implied consent for two years, again, two years, to send CEMs to anyone who has purchased, leased, or bartered a product, good, service, or land from you, so if you've uh, given, you know, like, charge them a fee for a particular services, like for example, JFS over there, I'm sure you charge people services for services, that would be an example. Um, you have, so you have applied consent for two years to send them CM. Alternatively, if they've accepted a business investment, gaming opportunity, uh, bought a raffle ticket for you, for example, uh, offered by the sender in the preceding two years, again, two years, you've got applied consent to send them CMs, or a written contract is created or had existed between the recipient and the sender in the preceding two years. So you've got a contract with uh, your suppliers, you've got a contract with a sponsor, whatever it is. So you've got two years um, from the time that that contract ends. You have two years of applied consent to send MCM. Or alternatively, you, can, you have six months to send CMs to anyone that falls under this, uh, that, sorry, that has sent you uh, an inquiry or an application for any one of these services or these particular activities. 
Um, and so, but they haven't actually followed through. So, for example, if someone sends me a, an inquiry about my legal legal services and I say, here's what, what I can do and here's how much I'll uh, charge you, but they don't follow through and don't uh, retain me, I still have six months after that, six months only, to send them, uh, I've applied to send for six months to send them receipts. Okay. So that's the existing business relationship. Proving implied consent. I'm going to hand over to Jim. So the rules are, are fairly explicit, but what it really boils down to from a technology standpoint is how are you going to prove that you have implied consent over those two years? So there's some very important things. What was the relationship you had with your constituents? When did it start? When did it renew possibly? And did they opt out? Um, so you have to have a, um, a CRM, a customer relationship management tool, RE, Razor's Edge, one of the ones out there, that will allow you to track your constituents and have all of those things, the date, what the relationship was, and whether they've opted out, because if they opt out, it overrides all of the implied consents anyways. So. Okay. Express consent. Express consent. All right, so we talked about implied consent. There's a, another part to implied consent regarding the transition period. I want to get to that at the end, but I want to talk about express consent first. So we talked, remember I said there are two types of consent? Implied consent and express consent. I'm going to talk in detail a little bit about express consent, but just to get you to understand what express consent is. Express consent is basically someone saying to you, orally or in writing, please send me electronic messages, commercial electronic messages. Please send me a newsletter. Please send me, I subscribe to XYZ. So I subscribe to, I want to receive your electronic messages. Here's my email address, send me stuff. That's express consent. They actually physically have to tell you that. And unlike implied consent, where it's not something that they've said, it's based on your relationship with them. So express consent under Castle, as I mentioned, can be orally or in writing. So someone can say, please, on the phone. They send me electronic messages. That's fine. Problem with that? How do you prove it? Because don't forget, I mentioned in the beginning, the onus is on you to prove it. So always better to get it in writing. Always get better to have a system to keep track of oral consents. Um, the request for express consent has specific requirements that you have to meet. So if you're going to send out an email, and a show of hands of anyone who's in the past, uh, I don't know, month or so received email, particularly from law firms, asking for, for you to give them consent. There you go. All right. So that's why are they doing that? Because you can ask someone to give you express consent. Can I get to it in a second? You can only do that before July 1st, 2014. I'll explain why. But in any event, um, if someone says to you by email, please send me electronic messages, great, you're fine, you'll have express consent, and it's indefinite until they withdraw, until they, until they opt out, okay? Now, when you send that email out, like the ones you've been receiving, there's a few things that have to be in that email, or, in, or if it's been writing in a, on a piece of paper or on your website, what are the requirements? So first of all, you have to state the purpose for which consent is being sought clearly and simply. So if you have sought express consent to collect, the, to, to, for, you know, to um, keep the person's email address because uh, you want to, uh, I don't know, um, send them a receipt or something, like a receipt for a donation, and that's all they've consented to, then you, can't, you haven't received express consent to send them any type of other electronic message. So you have to explain to them clearly and simply that they're consent, what they're consenting to, okay? The sender's identification and contact information and or the person on whose behalf the email is being sent have to be clearly stated in the request for consent. Okay, and that has to be valid for 60 days, the uh, information, the, uh, the contact information. And the statement that the receiver can withdraw the consent. So when you're asking for consent, let's say in that email that you send out, you have to say, you know, please give me, cons by clicking here, your consent to send, for me sending you whatever it is, electronic messages, use whatever word you want to use. But then you have to say, you may withdraw your consent at any time. They have to know that. No pre-check boxes. What is that? Okay, well, the CRTC, this doesn't appear in the legislation. CRTC, remember, that's the regulator. They have said that as of July 1st, 2014, they will consider pre-check boxes not to be expressed consent. Because, remember I said it's an opt-in regime, so someone has to do something to consent. Because CRTC thinks that if you have, and you, everybody know what I, what I mean by pre-check box, you know everybody has that for their, well, everybody, most people have that in their privacy, uh, privacy uh, legislation requests. 
It's a little pre-check button, you have to uncheck it. So the CRPC says having someone uncheck something is not having them consent to something. It's, it's basically opting out as opposed to opting in. I don't see why, but that's their position. And if they're the regulators, that's what you need to keep in mind. Okay, so they are going to consider pre-check boxes after July 1st, 2014, not to comply with the express consent requirement. If you're going to seek someone's consent, make sure it's not a pre-check box. Finally, and this is very important, and the reason why you're getting all these emails before July 1st, 2014, and why you need to get on this now, is because after July 1st, 2014, once this legislation comes into force, legislation states that you cannot send out an electronic message seeking consent. Okay? So when people think about express consent, they think, oh, well, what's the big deal? I'll just send some of the person an email and ask them to consent for me to, with consent, to give me consent, and I can send them the next email with what I want to send them. And not after July 1st, 2014. Once you do that, and I'll answer your question in a sec, once you do that, you are in violation of CASEL. Because what is that? Why? Because that, under the CASEL, is a CM, and you don't have consent to send it. The only way you can do that is if you already have consent by the person. So, for example, if you have implied consent. So, if you're already in an existing relationship, for example, with a previous donor, you have implied consent, in which case you can send them CMs, and you can then send an email asking for consent, because that's a CM. Okay? Is that what, was that your question? Yeah, that was the question. There you go. So, I, I was getting there. I, as I said, if you wait to the end, I probably will cover most of your, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. So, yeah, that was the issue. So, what, what does that mean? I'm going to be, just so you, you understand, because I get a lot of questions about this. That email that you're, you've been getting out, you've been getting now, please give us consent. Okay? You've been getting it because, particularly the law firms who are aware of this, have realized that they don't want to have to go through all their, they're going to have to anyways. But a lot of companies say, well, the first thing we're going to do, at the first line of defense, send out an email asking for consent because we can do it now, right? We can do it before July 1st. It doesn't matter if we already have consent. We can, they get that email out, people will consent. Once they consent, we're good. Put them in our database, they've given us consent. Until they withdraw, I can send them a CM. Right. Sorry, yeah? Um, what happens if I send out an email asking for express consent and I don't get a feedback from that email, but I still have implied consent? Can I? You have implied consent. If you have implied consent, you have implied consent. You have implied consent until someone unsubscribes, until someone opts out. Okay. So if you send out a, con a request for consent um, and no one answers, and this what to, to person X, okay, that person hasn't responded. But you already have implied consent from them because uh, they are a previous donor, for example. You can send, still send them CM, but only for the two-year period. Okay. So, it, express consent doesn't override implied consent. It's just an extra set of protection. It's just either or, right? You don't have to have. Well, you can have one or the other. We can have both. But what, why is implied consent important? Because as I, as I mentioned, after July first, two thousand and fourteen, you technically cannot send out an electronic message asking for consent. Can't do it. The only way you can do it after July 1st, 2014 is if you already have consent because you have an implied consent relationship. Okay? Is that, is that understood? Okay. I'm just a little bit confused because I'm getting a lot of emails from a lot of people saying, give me your consent. Yeah. When I've already, I have implied consent. Right. It's because, it's because it's an, extra, it's an extra layer of protection. What, what I would recommend everybody do is go through their all their list and send that email blast to everybody on your list right now. Because at, once you get that, then you have to, and we'll, um, uh, Jim will talk about uh, sifting through and, you know, and, and clear, going, actually doing an analysis of who is consent and who has it, who you have applied consent with, who you don't. But whether or not you have applied consent, it doesn't stop them from sending you that email out. Right? right. You, you, they can still send it to you. Because the, the point the point is is to, to first of all implied consent remember what I mentioned it's not indefinite it's only two years okay express consent is indefinite until it's until it's withdrawn so if you say okay like for example just as an example you're a client of mine okay because you're a client of mine I have implied consent to communicate to send you CF because of the existing business relationship all right. But you haven't been a client of mine for, I don't know, a year. Right now, granted, there's a transition period. I don't want to get, I'm going to get into it later, but just not to confuse for a minute, okay? Assume there's no transition period. So, 
two years are, are over since you know, I've started. I've stopped giving you any services, sending you any invoices. That two years are is over. Done. I can't send you any more CM. But if you give me express consent, then I can go on for as long as I, I, I for as long, until you say you'll stop. Okay. So that's why you want to send that. You get. You want to get that express consent. So once you have it, that's it. You're good. It's like an upgrade. It's exactly exactly. It's it's an upgrade and it's and it's a way of uh, it's a protection. It's a layer of protection. Right? Express consent is indefinite until it's withdrawn, until someone unsubscribes. Implied consent is not indefinite. It ends after that two-year period ends. Okay? Uh, uh, do, you, do you mind if we take questions again only because we want to go... You'll probably hear a lot of the answers already. It's related to this uh, Okay. Question. All right. So when you send implied if someone has said no, if no, that's what we said. A lot of people are afraid of it. They're afraid to send that request because people are saying no. Yeah. If they said no, why would you want to send them any more electronic messages? Why? They, they're not going to donate to you. They're not interested in hearing from you. First of all, if they opt out, if they say no and they opt out, you can't send any more electronic messages to the passive. We're going to talk about that in a minute when we talk about the information requirements and the unsubscribe. But, but, why would you want to communicate with someone who doesn't want to hear from you? Think about it from a more, a more basic level. You know, as I said, a lot of, a lot of charities are terrified. They're terrified, oh, we don't want to send that email out because we don't want to hear if you, um, the no, the no, okay? Well, if again, if you get the no, why are you, why are you, even, why are you communicating with this person? Right? Now, you have an exemption. We'll talk about the charity's exemption later, and you can probably send, still probably send them emails uh, seeking to raise funds, and we're going to get to that. That's why I'd like to answer questions at the end, so once you have the whole picture, but from a more basic level, why would you be scared of it? It, it, it gives you a message. The message is, because this is sort of the positive part of it. There's not that much positive for Castle, frankly. But very, very little. Maybe just to me, because I get a lot of work. <laughs> Sorry to say. But, um, but, but, it, but there's one thing that is good from a marketing perspective, and it really gets you thinking about communicating with the people who actually want to hear from you. Okay, if I get emails that... I don't want to hear from that person. I don't open the email. I don't read it, right? So, so think about that. Just, just an idea. Don't be scared because it actually is a tool. So, and about tools, I'm going to get hand over to, to Jim. He's the tool guy. <laughs> um, just to back up for just a second, think about three different types of constituents in general in your system. You've got those that you can prove implied consent. You have those that you can prove express consent. And then you have that whole bunch of emails and people that you can't remember where you got their email addresses from. That's kind of, these are the people that you need to talk to before July 1st because you can't prove express consent and you can't prove implied consent at all. And those are the ones that you're really going after. So segment out to them, message to them specifically, and try and get them to come in. Um, express consent is another one that's tracked in the CRM and a lot of the same things I mentioned for the implied consent. You want the the how and the when and the what type of relationship you have. And another one is what kind of message type they want to receive. It's, it gives you another a positive benefit of what Castle is going to bring to you is you can actually start talking to your, your constituents a little better and find out exactly what they want to get. If you give them that blanket up subscribe button at the bottom, a lot of systems will all of a sudden kick them out and they won't get anything at all. So what you really want to try and do is find what kind of message types you send and then customize your touches to your constituents in that type of, of way. Um, and then store that on their constituent record when they opted in and what they opted into. Right. The transitional period. Yeah. Right. So I left this to the end after I co we covered implied and express consent because I really need, this is where the transitional period really needs to be sort of understood. Thank you very much. So, Remember at the beginning I said there's a date you have to keep in mind, July 1st, 2017. That's the end of the transitional period. I, I will answer your questions. I, get, I will try to, I, I get a lot of the same questions on a regular basis, so I probably will already cover what you want to ask. If not, I'm happy. I will answer. Don't worry. Okay, so what is a transitional period? It is a really confusing part of Castle. And frankly, as a lawyer who has now spent a lot of time dealing with Castle, really, in the past several months, since basically since December, since the regs period, I have, I believe I finally have a doubt, but it took me a while to put your cabin down. And, and there are lawyers out there that get it, I'll, I'll be honest, wrong often. And a lot of organizations out there that are getting it wrong because they just don't, because it's badly drafted, it's just a badly worded kind of, uh, badly worded provision of the act. 
but I just said, I, I, I believe I, I have it right. In fact, I'm very confident I have it right. So, you, so what I'm going to tell you now is the right way to deal with the transitional period. But if you have any questions, and I'm sure you will, I will deal with those as well. So what does it say? So this is what it says. Um, if before July 1st, 2014, in other words, now, okay, you are in an existing business or non-business relationship with someone, so in the, the example of the non, the implied consent, this is an implied consent situation. The non-business relationship, we talked about what is that? That is, if you're a charity, it's your donors and your volunteers. If you're an NPO, it's your members. Okay. So for anyone who has, I'm going to give us, I'm going to talk about charities as an example. If you're a charity, anyone who has donated to you or volunteered for you at any time before July 1st, 2014, could have been 40 years ago. But according to the CRPC, it's 25 years they give an example. Could be any time. As long as, it, as long as it happened before July 1st, 2014, and you have been sending them CEMs on a regular basis, so you've been communicating with them because they're in your database, okay? If, that's the, if, you meet, if they meet those two requirements, then you have implied consent to send them CEMs until July 1st, 2017. Remember, I, remember how we talked about that particular relationship you have only two years under Castle? They gave you an extra extra year at the beginning just to give you extra time to sort of get to, to, to talk to your constituents and get express consent from them. So they basically said, here's an extra year as a gift. But that's only for people who are you already are in an existing business or non-business relationship with. So those people who have donated to you, volunteered for you, or your members if you're an NPO. And as well that you've already been, you've been communicating with them on a regular basis. So if it's someone who donated to you 30 years ago, but you haven't sent them a CM in the past, I don't know, 10 years, they're not, they don't fall into that. There's, there's got to be a regular communication. They have to be on your email list. They have to be receiving your e-blast or whatever it is. So if they meet those requirements, you have an extra year. Okay. Same for the business relationship. So remember I talked about an existing business relationship. It's also a two-year period. Usually, generally, after July 1st, 2014, it's going to be a two-year period. Um, if you are an existing business relationship, for example, I'm a lawyer, you're my client, you be my client, for the, you were my client three years ago, for example, but we haven't communicated, we talked about that earlier, I, but I've been sending you newsletters in the past three years, okay? If that's the case, I can continue doing that, I have implied consent from you until July 1st, 2017, under review. Okay, so that's a transitional period, that is what it's all about. It's not a grace period, it doesn't mean that... You, you have another. You have until July 1st, 2017 to comply with Castle. That's not the case. Just means you have an extra year for that implied consent relationship. After July 1st, 2014, it's a two-year period. Okay. So if anyone donated to you on August 1st, 2014, you only have two years. Okay. Although, frankly, you should have till July 1st, 2017. And I'm kind of thinking that that's a little bit weird about Castle, but anyways, that's what it is. Right, so that's the transitional period. Now, I am before I go ahead on that one, I'm going to have you ask uh, ask questions because that one is a tough one. You may want to have to think about it and ask at the end. But yeah, go ahead. So, how tight is the two years? Is it two years plus a day? No, it's two years. Update my list, but so somebody gave it to me two years ago. Yeah. And so the next day, it's two years plus a day, and they file a complaint because like, how often do I have to update? The two years start on the date that the relationship ended, okay? So if they donated you to you on, okay, first of all, let me, let me just talk about this. Remember what I said about the transitional period, right? So anyone who has donated to you before July 1st, 2014, July, you have until July 1st, 2017, don't think about it. But let's go forward, okay? Let's assume now, two years from now, it's July 1st, 2015. Whatever, it's, it's June, what is, what, what's the date today? 17. June 17th, 2015. Someone donates to you. They just gave you one donation. They didn't regularly donate to you every day. That's it. One donation. The day after that, the, the two years period starts. Okay. So I would say two years from the day. So if it's July, June, if they donated, they donated to you June 17, 2015, you have until June 17, 2017, to send them CMs, implied consent. After that, no more implied consent. Right. No, not only CMs, any CMs after the two years, yeah. And we'll talk about the tracking and we'll get to that. And you've got the 10 year, or the, the 10 year, the two day, or the 10 day to update systems, but that's, but that's, that's separate that's from this. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that. But as I said, if you, we're going we're to talk about compliance and how you keep track of stuff 
in a minute. So, you know, I want to just specifically about the transitional period because it's a confusing part. I just want to make sure you understand. Yeah. So, well, with, with the transition period or with the timeline in general, um, with the first two implied consents, if someone's giving you a business card. Right. Or publishers only. Is there any time No. Or those are indefinite. This is so, just the relationship. Remember, I mentioned the two first two are indefinite. The, the, impl the existing non-business relationship or business relationship, those are the two-year periods. So I'm just, I mean, we're actually just thinking them out now, but I should think from a personal perspective. Yeah. Meaning, we're switching around, or people might start thinking about switching around. The minute I hand someone a business card, that's actually now one of their best ways of holding my implied consent forever. No, yes. Except remember what I said about those. Those only apply to CM sent that are relevant to your business. Right, so they're very li it's very limited in scope. It's not CM for everything else, as opposed to the existing business and non-business relationship, which is CM that that's that's on, like it doesn't have to do, do with your business. It could be about your person send the sender's business, right? Which is what you want, right? You want to talk about your business if you're the sender, not the recipient. Yeah. So if we haven't sent a CM on a regular basis in the last year, I would I would be careful about it. Yeah. Um, because, again, as I mentioned, the legislation is very ambiguous. Right. All it says is, I can't, I'm, I, and I, I, I'll probably, you know what, I'm going to check the wording exactly. Okay. But my recollection, it uses the word regularly set CMs or something of the sort. I'm, I'm going to look at it. So I, I, it doesn't say about how, how often it needs to be, but there's got to be some kind of communication. I'm going to go check it. Uh, that's a good question. I'm going to see if, uh, how, how often you have to set CMs. I'll check that out from the break. Yeah. Hmm. In your first conversation about the implied consent, you said, consent is implied when the sender is a registered charity and the recipient has made a donation or wrong to it in the two years prior to sending the message. Yeah. In the two years prior to sending the message. Yeah. So, so, so if I'm going to send a message today, I go back two years. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And so, they're not further than two years. Well, no, you can't go back two years, but that's only after July 1st, 2014. What I'm saying about the transitional period, again, is that you kind of have to think of it on a forward basis. It's the weird, it's the weird way it's written. It's not, I'm just saying how the legislation is written. But, but anyone who has donated to you or volunteered to you before July 1st, 2014, this is just for the transition period, okay? You have until July 1st, 2017. That two-year period becomes just basically until July 1st, 2017. Just you get, a, you get an extra time. Do you, do you understand? I understand that part. Yeah. Okay. So after July 1st, 2014, the day after they donated to you, you've got two years to send those electronic messages, then, and then it's done. The apply consent is over. It's, you, can, you can think of it two years back from the other message, or you can think of it two years forward. But it doesn't matter. It's still two years from the date they donated. Okay? Or a volunteer. It, it's, it's either or. Yeah. So does this mean with the transitional period that if I've been dealing with people regularly through email and we've got a business relationship, I now have a three-year period in which I can go and ask for express consent? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> but you have to have the existing business the existing relationship under, yeah. under, under the, uh, the, uh, the definition that we talked about. Yes, okay. yes, that's what it means. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm just going to this in the gentleman. Yeah. Uh, two questions. One is, is there any circumstance where like, we're required to send out a notice of an Right. Is there any circumstance? Okay, so you know what? A notice of AGM, for example, is likely not going to be a CM because there's nothing commercial about it. You're just notifying them about your meeting that you have to do. You have to notify under the legislation. But you might say be sure to renew your membership so you're eligible. So then, at that point, it becomes a CM. So you've got to be careful about that. I, you're right. That's a good point. Then, if you do that, then it becomes a CM. What can I say? This castle doesn't make sense sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> You're required to do it under your legislation, I agree, yeah. right? You have to send that AGM notice, but you have to do it. But then, being, that being said, let's go back a minute and think about it. All your, all your members, okay, all the people that are going to get that email are existing members, yeah. in which case you have implied consent to send that email, right, AGM notice, okay? So it, it does work that way, but for, if for some reason you're sending a notice of an the AGM to someone who is not a member, you may be violating Castle. And the, the second question, you, I thought I heard you referring to one year for something, but I don't understand the connection. No, no, the, if there's an extra, remember I said the implied consent is two years. All I said is the transition period allows you an extra year, so it's three years, right? Until July 1st, 2017. 
it up for you. Yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Just how does this apply to uh, societies and to um, activist groups who are organized against local issues? Okay, good, good question. Uh, all right, so the question is how does it apply to societies and organized, uh, like, like activist groups? Activists, like okay. Okay, so are they nonprofit organizations based on the definition of an income, the income tax act definition? They don't have to be registered, but they have to meet that definition, which is, um, here, hold on a sec. I will, again, at the, at the break, I'm going to give you the definition of what a nonprofit organization means. Some would and some wouldn't. So okay. Yeah, but they often, often they would meet, right, okay, so often those particular type of associations will meet the nonprofit organization definition. They don't have to be registered charities. They have to be nonprofit organizations. I will tell you what that definition is. We always say, we, I, I should include it in my, in my, uh, in my slides, um, but at the break, actually, you know what, why don't we do this? Um, all right, so before we go to the information requirements, why don't we, uh, just give me a second and, uh, and uh, I'll just go to get you the, yeah, if you don't mind getting you just the, the back. Okay, so we should have taken it out before. There's, there's a definition for non nonprofit organizations, okay, um, in the Act. And it basically is the same definition as is in the Income Tax Act. And what it says is, and I should just have it out all the time because I always get this, this question. Um, I usually have my computer in front of me, so it's <laughs> easier as opposed to the printed version, but just give me one second. So I, I believe those societies will probably meet the definition. So the definition of a, of a non-profit organization under CASEL is, okay, um, is a club, association, or voluntary organization is a non-profit organization that is organized and operated exclusively for social welfare, civic improvement, pleasure, or recreation, or for any purpose other than personal profit if no part of its income is payable to or otherwise available for the personal benefit of any proprietor, member, or shareholder of that organization, unless the proprietor, member, or shareholder is an organization whose primary purpose is the promotion of amateur athletics and tennis. That, that the, the end applies particularly to sports organizations. But if you mean it, that definition, so a society, for example, might meet that definition as long as there's no profit to any one of the members. And if that's the case, then you meet the nonprofit organization implied consent part. Right, which is the members have implied consent of all members. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I have my question about members. So. Oh, and why don't I read the definition of membership before? Is that will that help you? Well, I might. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me tell you what the membership definition is. Again, I should include that in my in my slides. I'm going to make a note <laughs> for my next presentation because I get that that often. So membership in a nonprofit organization. Is, so it's very broad. Is the status of having been accepted as a member of a club, association, or voluntary voluntary organization in accordance with its membership requirements? Which basically means, as long as you meet that definition of a NPO, a, a club, association, voluntary organization, and the person has been accepted as your member, or an organization has been accepted as your member under your bylaws, for example. But we have very few members, but we have <coughs> Of our cause. Yeah, of our cause. So we have lots of friends right, that aren't members. official aren't official members. So, so they won't meet that definition. So you won't have a flight consent. So we have like faulty requirements. Uh, yeah, so what, what what does that mean then? It means that you gotta start thinking if you want to communicate with these people, you gotta think about how you're gonna how you're gonna apply cast the requirements if you expect consent or you get them to become members. What, whatever it is, you can change your bylaws or there are ways to get around them. As a lawyer, there's a lot of things. But what I mean by ways to get around is you have to sit down and start thinking about it if you want to communicate with these people. All right, so I'm going to go on, and I will answer more questions, but we have a lot to cover, and I will. I promise we will try to get to all your questions at the end, okay? So remember at the beginning I said there are two types of requirements. I'm going to get back to the, to the sort of start of the presentation. Two types, two type, two requirements regarding CS, right? Two, two requirements. The first one is, you have to get consent, express or implied, but you have to get consent. First, the second requirement, you have to include in each and every CEM particular information. Okay, if you don't include that information, you are in violation of CASEL. So, 
what is, what is that information? Well, first of all, all CEMs must include the sender's, uh, con well, it has to identify the sender or the org and or the person or organization on behalf of whom the email is being, the electronic message is being sent. You have to remember, so if you're an individual, you identify yourself and you identify the organization. And you have to include the contact details of that particular individual and organization, including the name, mailing address. Make sure you have a mailing address. It's a really archaic, uh, really archaic, I mean, seriously. But they, they even said, oh, if you're like, you know, working from home, uh, what do you do? Well, you know, seriously says, well, just get a PO box. But you have to have a mailing address. Uh, and you have to have an email, you have to uh, include an email or telephone number. So it doesn't have to be both email or telephone number of the sender. But that information has to be valid for 60 days. So if you move, what do you do? That's what they, they access. It's got to be valid for 60 days. So if you have a telephone number, you have to make sure it's valid for 60 days. If you have an email address, you have to make sure it's valid for 60 days after you send that electronic message. In addition to that, you have to include a means by which to contact the sender. So again, having an email address or phone number, that's a means by which to contact you. Okay? And finally, and very important, you have to have an unsubscribe mechanism. So we'll talk about what that requires, it's, what, what are the requirements about unsubscribe in a minute. But those are the three things you need to have. You've got to identify yourself and any person on whose behalf or organization on whose behalf you're sending the email. You have to include the contact information that's valid for 60 days, and you have to have an unsubscribe mechanism. Yes? Yeah, that's fine. That's okay, but what if he quits? That's, then you have to update it. That's a good question. Well, you have to keep it still keep his email address. Active. 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 Yeah. And have someone check. That's exactly a perfect example. So, there you go. There, there, there's ways to get around it, right? I left my, uh, my, my former firm. Um, my email apparently doesn't work anymore, um, but they should have kept it uh, active for 60 days under Castle, but Castle's not enforcing it. Okay. Um, so here's the other thing. So what it says, the Castle says, well, we'll give you a bit of a reprieve. If it's impractical, so they use the words impractical, what does that mean? No. Um, to include all of these requirements in each and every CEM, what you can do is you can create a website or a URL on your website where you have all this information, including an unsubscribe, and you must include the link to that website prominently displayed in your electronic, each and every electronic message. So that's another prominently and clearly. So they have, it can be buried, it has to be pretty prominent that they can click here to, to unsubscribe and to find out who you are. Unsubscribe. Okay, so the unsubscribe mechanism, very important aspect of Castle. Uh, the unsubscribe mechanism must be effective for 60 days a day. Okay, so they have to be able to unsubscribe at any time, 60 days after you send the email. It has to be provided, it, it, you have to be put in the same means that uh, the message was sent or any other electronic means. You have to, they, sorry, they, that's the way they have to, they can unsubscribe. For example, electronic means click here electronically and it will take you to a website. Here, click here to unsubscribe. That's fine, that's electronic. If you don't want to do that, it's too onerous, it's too uh, expensive. Uh, I don't think it's that expensive, but if you don't want to do that, that's okay. What you have to do then, have a different means, electronic means. For example, say to unsubscribe, email back unsubscribe, or email do not send. That's all fine, that's good if you send out the email by email. So if you send out the CM by email, you can have it sent back by email unsubscribe. Back two things. First of all, you have to make sure that you, uh, someone is on the receiving end of that, and then they implement it, right? Second of all, if it's a text, it's not going to work. So if you're sending it by text, it has to be only by text that they can unsubscribe. Okay? Same means in which the message has been sent. The mechanism has to be a no cost to the unsubscriber. And finally, very important, you have to implement the request for an unsubscribe within 10 days of the email. That 10 days, that's where Jim mentioned 10 days, and he's going to talk about how you, you know what to do and how you implement that in the CRM. So if you send that email out, you have 10 days, and the person who responds right away and says, do not send, you still have 10 days to send the CM. I wouldn't. But you, have, you at least have 10 days to process the request, okay? 
after that 10 days, you, you make sure that you are actually processed. And why an unsubscribe mechanism is just as important as the consent. So the, the, the unsubscribe is an opt-out, right? And what it does is basically says, if you have consent, to send a CM. So assuming you're already sending a CM, that means you already have consent, implied or expressed. But then that person can change their mind and say, no, we don't want, we don't want to receive anything. Fine. You have to implement it. Once you implement, they implement it, whether or not you have implied or expressed consent, it's over, finished. Okay, you can't send anymore. But also think about if you're going to really focus on your putting together castle uh, policy and really making sure that you uh, follow through, and you should be, you know, making sure you you apply all the castle requirements. But if you're going to really focus on something, focus on the unsubscribe, because if someone has told you we don't want to hear from you, and then you send them an email. That's likely, most, more likely going to be the person who's going to go to fightspam.gc.ca and file a complaint against you. Just think about that as a, more of a, uh, but, you know, but I'm, I'm not saying you should focus on just complying with the unsubscribe. Comply with everything. And subscribe it. As I mentioned before, there's kind of two different two systems that a lot of people use. There's the CRM that keeps all of their constituent records, and then there's a mailing system that they feed everything up to and send out from there. Um, that's probably where most of your unsubscribes are going to be tracked initially. Um, so you need to track all of those. Um, they're kind of like the explicit consent, only they're explicit unsubscribes. Um, lost the word, sorry. Um, so you have to make sure that you unsubscribe, and an unsubscribe means unsubscribe from anything that, uh, any electronic communication that they're wanting. Um, that's why I talked about trying to drive people to select what they want to receive and then allow them to unsubscribe from everything um, on that same page. All right, so exemptions. <coughs> All right. Go back a minute Sorry. before you guys get too excited. Uh, remember at the beginning of the uh, presentation, I talked about castle history and that in 2010 it was uh, passed, then it was lots of lobbying, everybody was lobbying the government for an exemption. A few got some exemptions. Keep in mind, what we have now is what we, they've come up with after three and a half years. It took a while. <laughs> so they've given it some thought, I hope they did. <laughs> Because, and the reason I'm saying that is because we get a, I get a lot of attrition and everybody's like, well, oh, that can't be, it's not possible, blah, blah. Um, they may change their mind. They're not going to change anyone. They, they, they've already thought this through. It's been three and a half years. So what they've done is three and a half years of, of lobbying, as I mentioned, the charities and nonprofits were very strong. We're trying to get, what they were trying to do, you were trying to do, is get a full exemption from Castle. We know we're charities. We're not, we don't send spam, get, exempt us. What the government said is no. They did not exempt charities or nonprofits. What they have done, they have, we said, we'll give you an exemption, they said, sorry. But it's not going to be a complete exemption. I'm complying. They created the regist registered charities exemption. So it is an exemption that applies only to registered charities under Income Tax Act. So if you're a nonprofit organization but not a registered charity, it doesn't apply to you. Okay, that's the first part. If you're a registered charity, you do have an exemption, but it's not a complete. What it says is you are exempted from CASEL's requirements only for CEMs that are sent by on behalf of a registered charity as, that have as it, their primary purpose, or primary purpose, keywords, raising funds for the charity. Okay. That's the words that are used in, in the regulation. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay, well, let's talk about the particular exemption. There's a lot of I find these days particularly a lot of misconceptions about what it means. Misunderstanding, the reason that it's misunderstanding is because, frankly, CASEL hasn't been tested yet, right? It hasn't gone to court, hasn't been applied yet, no one knows really how it will be applied. I've been giving this a lot of thought. I've been, I've been uh, advising charities and nonprofits about it, and I've been watching the CRM, sorry, the, CRM, the CRTC and what it's been saying. Basically, the way I interpret the legislation is that there's going to be a focus on the words primary purpose. Why is there a focus on the words primary purpose? Well, if we go back to the original definition of a CM, if you recall, what it said is a CM is any electronic message that has as its purpose, or one of its purposes, uh, encouraging participation in commercial activity. So there's all, all there has to be is one word or two words in the bottom of that email and it becomes a CM. 
for the registered charities exemption, you're only exempted for electronic messages that are sent for the primary purpose. So it has to be the main purpose, the main focus of the email, the first, the ask, okay? So you've got to be putting it as your main primary purpose of the email that you are raising funds for the charity. But I get this from charities a lot. They say, well, all the emails we send out are for raising funds, right? Because let's face it, we're charities. We want to raise funds. No. You may... Your, your primary purpose is probably to raise funds because that's what you want to do. But you've got to ask yourself this. Is the person reading that email, when they read the email, thinking reasonably, this is for the primary purpose of raising funds. That's the message they're trying to convey to me. Are they asking me for money? Or are they, ask, are they asking me to buy something? Are they asking me, are they selling me tickets? Are they, um, are they you know, inviting me to an event where they're going to be raising funds for the charity? Are they selling me a service that is raising funds for the charity? If that's clear from the message, then you're likely exempted. But if it's not, if it's an e-newsletter, tells me all the wonderful things you've been doing, great, great stuff you're doing, and it says, oh, to find out more or don't need to look here, that's likely not for the primary purpose of raising funds. Because if I'm reading that email, I don't see it as something that's trying to get me to pay to, to, to raise, to, to donate. It's something that's trying to, at least based on the information, uh, it's trying to educate me about the wonderful things your child is doing. Let me just finish, and then I'll answer your questions. I, I, I promise. <laughs> so, what does that mean? It means that you do not have a blank exemption for all your emails if you're a registered charity. What you have is an exemption that applies to only emails where the primary purpose, the ask, is first. Okay, put the ask first. If you do that, you may you're likely exempted from, from charities uh, from the from Castle's requirements. But then you've got to ask yourself this, and I, I have a lot of, yeah, I get a lot of questions about, oh, well, well maybe how do we draft the wording that would make it for the primary purpose? From a marketing perspective, does it make sense? Does it really make sense to put the ask first? Maybe it does for certain things, but not for other emails, right? Sometimes you want to do, you want to have a different approach. You want to be more creative. You want to, you want to tell people about all the great stuff you're doing, and maybe you have to want to don't it? Because maybe you won't, that way you won't turn them off, for example, right? So, do you really want to rely on that exemption? You've got to think about that okay? when, you, when you're trying to figure out how you're going to comply with Castle. Do you want to you know, find a way to have a primary purpose? You want to take a chance that, that someone will complain about you and then the CRTC will come back and say, you know, we don't think this is for the primary purpose of raising funds. We actually see it as something else. And then you've got to go call me. I'll, I'll be happy to argue on your behalf. But you're going to have to pay me my legal fees. So do you really want that? Maybe what you should, uh, you should what, before you decide whether or not you want to rely on that exemption, you should think about going back one step and saying, well, maybe we should just get consent. And that way we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that, 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 the, that uh, the gentleman had a question, and then I'll go to you. And I'm going to only take two questions about this, but I promise at the end I will answer more questions about it. Did you have, are you okay? I, I, okay, that's fine. Okay, I'm sorry. I want to talk to the, the defining raising funds. Does raising funds right. count if it's Cost, a cost recovery event. Right, okay. So, good question, good question, fantastic question. Second part of that, that, uh, that definition is what does raising funds mean? Good question. That's something that came up a lot because, as you know, as a registered charity, the CRA defines fundraising in a very narrow way, right? Here's the thing. First of all, it doesn't use the words fundraising. It uses the words raising funds, okay? So, there's been some talk about it might be broader than that. It's basically anything. It's not necessarily just what the, what CRA considers to be fundraising. Okay, it's more. It's anything that gets money for the charity. And if any of you are following Imagine Canada, maybe that was one of the questions that were going to come up. So Imagine Canada has recently put out a newsletter um, talking about uh, the what they believe is the definition of raising funds. They're saying it's much broader than that. It's anything. It's service paid for a service, that kind of stuff. And they. Uh, based on what I read on Imagine Canada's website, is based on what they were told by Industry Canada, who who are the ones that actually wrote this this particular drafted this particular regulation. I mean, I, I'm, I have it on the back of my my to do list is to call to talk to my the guy I know at Imagine Canada, ask him what that's based on. But that's hearsay of hearsay. I just want to point that. To, okay, so Imagine Canada is saying that, so it's, they're saying it's broader based on what they were told by Industry Canada. And by the way, Industry Canada is not the regulator. Okay? The CRTC is the regulator. And just so you should know, the CRTC has constantly said, you know, you can read the in guidelines that Industry Canada is putting out there, but we are not bound by it. So we don't know. <laughs> so that's very helpful, right? Exactly. 
We don't know whether or not what Industry Canada told Imagine Canada, which is telling us, that whether or not that's how the CRTC is going to, for example, but because I don't want to confuse you, <laughs> here's what I say. Don't think about what, no, don't, think. don't focus about what you're going to be doing with those funds. The way I see it is focus on the primary purpose. Because, about, sorry, about the message, okay? Castle is not about money, necessarily. It's not like the Income Tax Act, which uses the word fundraising, it's all about money. So then you know, think about what's, what's the money being used for. It's about the communication. It's about what the message that you're trying to send. And it's also a consumer protection legislation. So it's being, it's going to be likely interpreted from the view of the reader, the receiver, not the view of the sender. So it's about the message. I think you've got to look at it about whether, what is the message that you're sending? Is the message about the primary purpose of raising funds, whatever funds are? Register now. Whatever it is, like, you know, buy tickets, uh, you know, for our services, like we're, we're giving services and we're going to, you know, here's, here's, a, here's our great program about whatever services we're, so we're selling and we're selling big goods or whatever it is. So I don't think it really gets that, it, I don't believe they're going to get down to what those funds are going to be used at the end of the day for. I think what they're going to look at is what is the message. Is it, is it, does it convey for, that it's for the primary purpose of raising funds? That's my interpretation. And that's what I think Imagine Canada is kind of saying. They, 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 they're, not, they're a bit confusing with what they wrote on their website, Imagine Canada, because they kind of suggest that there's a very broad exemption. But what they were really saying is that raising funds is broader than fundraising. And it likely is, because they don't use the word fundraising. But I don't think that's really where you need to focus. I think you need to focus on your words, the words you're using in your message. Yes? Okay, so you were saying earlier that newsletters that at the bottom, for example, might have a donate now button would then be commercial yeah. because they're free. But on the other hand, if they're purely informational, they're exempt. Yeah. If they're primarily raising funds, they're exempt. Yeah. If they're a combination of the two, <laughs> then they're not exempt. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Pretty much. So what does that mean? It means do you really want to sit down and try to figure that out? Or do you want to just get consent? Make sure you know who you're, who, you're, who you're dealing with, who you're sending it to, and just making sure that your email is sent out to the right people. Here's, a, here's an example. I was just, we were just talking about this. A, a client um, had said to me, and we were having a discussion, and he said, oh, you know, maybe when we, we send a newsletter every two weeks for a registered charity. Why, why don't you review it every time we send out, and maybe you can try to figure out how we can write it for the primary purpose of raising funds. I said, why would you want me to do that? First of all, I'm going to charge you for every time I have to look at your newsletter. Second of all, I'm a lawyer. I'm not a marketer. I'm going to look at it and make sure it's for the primary purpose of raising funds. And then you probably are going to lose like a lot of the message you want to send out. I'm going to make sure it's like, you know, black and white, no question about it. It's not great. Why don't you just deal with the consent on the end and not have to worry about what the word says? Just as an example. But that's just, you know, one, one way of thinking about it. Um, you know what? I, I'm going to take more questions on you. We got it because there's more exemptions. Let's cover it all. I promise we'll get, we'll get to you, okay? Just time-wise. So that's the registered charities exemption. Guess what? There's more exemptions. That's not the only one. So if you're a nonprofit organization, a step back, that is not a registered charity, that exemption doesn't apply to you. But any one of some of the other exemptions might apply to you. If you're a registered charity, any one of these exemptions might also apply to you. It applies to everybody. So first of all, you, have, you are exempted from complying with Castle's requirements for anyone with whom you have a personal or family relationship. That is in quotation marks for a reason. Family relationship is <laughs> defined in Castle as a parent-child relationship. <laughs> so, that's it. Yeah. So you, you know, your grandparent, I, that might apply because it's a parent-child relationship like or something, but it's not a sibling. Sorry. You can't, you, can't, you can't send a CM to your brother or sister. However, however, you may have a personal relationship with your brother or sister and your sibling, so that's good, except the personal relationship is also defined in the act, and there has to be a, like a regular two-way communication. So if you haven't spoken, I hope not, but if you haven't spoken to your sibling in a year or two, you can't send them a CM under that exemption. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so personal and family relationships, not exactly the exemption you want to rely on. However, However, I've got clients who have asked me about this for like the refer a friend uh, campaign, right? So some people have a refer a friend campaign. You may want to use that if you, but then if you're going to do that, you got to make sure that you include in your refer a friend 
campaign, the exact wording of what a friend means under the personal relationship, for example. So you're going to use these. So you refer a friend means you only send it to these people. Okay. <clears throat> if you're going to rely on it, though, if you want to. Uh, oh, and by the way, um, just to be clear as well, the CRPC said your social media friends are not a personal relationship. So your Facebook friends, not a personal relationship. Someone likes you on Facebook, follows you on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, your relationship LinkedIn, not going to meet this requirement under uh, under Castle, and CRDC has said that again and again and again. Yes? Uh, maybe I missed this. If they like you on Facebook, is that part of uh, expressing consent? No. <laughs> Are they taking an action to no. say they want to receive the communications? No. They just said they just like you on Facebook. Under the, according, to the, according, according to the CRTC, I'm just telling you what the CRTC said, someone liking you on Facebook, following you on Twitter, is not giving you express consent. You've got to get express consent in a different way. But LinkedIn is, and they're trying to figure it out themselves. Subscribes them to your feed, so that's them asking you. Okay, to so them. here's here's the thing again about that, and we'll talk about. I'm gonna social media. I always get questions about social media. I'm, I'd rather get to it in the end, but let's might as well deal with it now, just on that issue, because social media. I can spend another two hours talking about how it applies to social media. Very complicated. Here's the thing. Yeah, you will probably you have consent. First of all, sorry. If we're talking about your feed on Twitter, for example or writing on your Facebook uh, page or on your LinkedIn wall or whatever. Uh, CRBC said posting on a wall or posting on a feed, etc., etc., is not a CEM because it doesn't go to an electronic address. It has to go to an electronic address. It goes on to a wall. Whatever. But if it's sent to an electronic address, so for example, if you get a LinkedIn email or you get a Facebook message, you know, sometimes it goes to your email account, or if you go to or Twitter and it goes to an email, that point is a CEM. You probably have you probably have consent. I'm not going to say for sure because it's complicated. <laughs> but you probably have consent to send those to the people who have followed you or unsubscribed, but just through those particular means, right? Like you can't just send them CMs, a different types of CMs. It's just stuff through what they've asked you actually to subscribe to. Okay, so it's not a general blanket consent. Right. But the owner of Facebook account decides whether they're going to receive emails on Facebook or not. You have no impact on that whatsoever. But I, I, under, I agree with you. I agree with you. The social media is, is a real pain, and I'm told that Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter are trying to figure this out, but they have to deal with it on their end because right now we don't like we don't know what the hell they're going to do. And, and you know, Facebook, Facebook and LinkedIn, and you know, and, and you know, Google and all the big ones, they they they're pretty much right out there right now, like scratching their heads. That's my understanding. I hope they're doing something about it, but they haven't done it yet. Anyway, <laughs> go on. Up. <laughs> hey, I'm like to do it. I'll be very busy. Um, a CEM can okay. So that's next uh, next exemption. A CEM consisting solely solely. What does solely mean? Only nothing else in that email. Okay, that's what CRDC says. Solely means just that. An inquiry or application relating to a commercial activity of the recipient. Someone sent you an inquiry about your event that you're putting. Okay. Only sorry. No, I'm the opposite. You're sending someone else an email or, like, or a, a, a asking, inquiring about their particular commercial activity. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to go on and then we'll get to take questions with you. Solicited CX. Remember at the beginning, at the beginning, I said, I really, they should have called this Canada's Anti-Unsolicited Email Communication Act or whatever. Really, it's about unsolicited email, right? It's about an opt-in. So the act gives you an exemption for responses to requests, requires, complaints, or otherwise solicited by the person to whom the message is sent. If it's solicited, it kind of makes sense. They already gave you consent. They want to hear from you. They're actually sending you email. It's like, please send me email. Um, internal CMs to the business. All right, so here's the thing about the internal exemption. <laughs> what it says is, you're exempted from communicating internally with your with your employees, but only with respect to anything to do with the, the, the as long as the message concerns the activities of the organization. So if it concerns something other than the activities of the organization, it's not exempted. And I always give this an example when I was at my law firm. Every once in a while, an email would go out saying, "Hey, I'm uh, walking for the cure, running for the cure," you know. Donate to me, join me, volunteer, whatever it is. We're a law firm. We're not in the business of, uh, you know, walking for the cure and raising funds. So that email would be would not be exempted. Okay, it would be in violation of Castle if there wasn't consent 
on the recipient's end. And the people who are technically under the act who would be violating, violating CASA would be that uh, employee who has sent help, but so is the organization on whose behalf it is sent to the charity for it. Yeah. Sorry. Um, another type of exemption, which I find, I tell people, do not try to rely on it for all your CMs. You might try for a few, but not all of them. Is the business to business organization to organization. So it says that you're exempted from complying with Castle if the emails are between businesses or organizations who have a relationship. It doesn't have to be whatever, it, it doesn't matter what the relationship is. There's been some kind of a relationship. But only if the, it concerns the, the, the um, business of the receiving organization. Okay, so if you're sending it to organization, uh, they're sending it again to a, to a law firm has to do with their legal services. CM sent to enforce a legal right, that's exempted, thank goodness. Uh, CM sent to foreign jurisdictions. Here, answer to your question from the beginning. I told you I'm going to get to most of these questions. So CM sent, remember how I said that CMs are basically any electronic message sent or accessed in Canada. So it's sent from Canada or accessed in Canada. But you're exempted from complying with Castle Rules requirements if you're sending your electronic messages outside of Canada. So the recipients are outside of Canada, like in the US. That's exempted from Castle's requirements. But Castle says you have to comply with the anti-spam laws of the receiving country. And if you don't, then you are in violation of Castle and the CRTC can go after you here. So if you're sending it there is a li there's a list of schedules, a schedule of, of countries who are on the list. So it has to be a country in the, on that list. You know, it's not all countries are on there, but there's a big, big chunk of them. Um, basically, all the countries that have an anti spam legislation that is so somewhat similar to ours. Now, granted, none, none of these are similar to ours. We're pretty much high on the top of the most onerous. Like, you know, I don't think we are the most onerous, but we're getting we're pretty much up there. Um, but most of the most of the anti spam legislations, like for example, in the U.S., are opt outs, not opt ins. But basically what it says is you need to know, if you're, if you're regularly sending emails in the U.S., you need to know about their anti-spam legislation, you have to comply with it, and if you don't, then uh, uh, CRTC can go after you here. And there's, they, call, they constantly talk about how they get their uh, sharing information with various international forces, it's like a big thing, really what they're doing, but if they are, that's what they're saying here. See, I'm sent by political parties for the primary purpose of soliciting contributions. Are exempt. So it's very similar to the charity's uh, exemption, it's primary purpose. Here, CM sent within an electronic platform where unsubscribe and identifying information is readily available. So to answer the, is, yeah, your question at the back, this is the type of exemption that may apply to social media type of accounts, but when you ask the CRTC what it applies to as an example, they always talk about the BlackBerry BBM type service. <laughs> <laughs> they just did that a week ago. And I'm like, what? Two weeks ago. No one uses that. So we don't really know what it means. But I, I think that if the social networks, like Facebook and LinkedIn and my, my just personal opinion, if they get actually, let's like, try to actually um, put this into play where they have an unsubscribe and identifying information are readily available, then you likely may be able to sort of fall under that exemption. But I, right now it's kind of iffy and gray and we don't know. CM sent within a limited access secure account by the person who provides that account. That's within the banking portal, so that's an exemption for banking portals. Two-way voice communication. I'm a castle, you can talk to people on the phone. <laughs> that's exactly. And faxes and voicemail messages. Um, so thank goodness you can send that old fax, you know. <laughs> and, and you notice that they exempted voicemail messages. The reason they exempted voicemail messages is because the way their, their legislation was originally drafted in 2010, it would have included voicemail messages. <laughs> so, so they had to actually exempt it that, uh, from Castle Compliance. Because frankly, as, based on the CEM definition, a CM would also include a voicemail message. Um, okay, so there's a, there, that, those, those, all those exemptions I talked about right now have basically exempt you from two things. They exempt you from getting consent. Great, you don't have to get consent. And they also exempt you from having the information and, uh, and unsubscribe requirements in the CM. You're done, you don't have to do any of that. Great. There's another form of exemption um, which says you don't have to get consent, but you still, if you fall under any of these, but you still have to include the information and unsubscribe. So it's a bit of a sort of a semi-exemption. The first one is the third party referral one. This is a very brief 
description of it. It's quite complicated, actually. But we don't have time to talk about it, and I'm happy to answer questions about it later. Um, it's based, what it says, basically, is if you are being... <laughs> I'm just, just going to give an example. It's a third-party referral situation. I'm going to talk about Jim. Okay, Jim and I, you have to have a bit, an existing, some form of a relationship with the person. So, for example, Jim and I have a, you know, an existing business relationship. And he refers um, Terry to me and says, oh, Terry would be interested in your legal services. Or he doesn't refer, he just gives me her email address and says, you should contact her. She's looking for someone to give her advice on Cassidy. Okay, so then under this exemption, now, if Karen Terry doesn't know me, she's never given me consent. So technically, under this exemption, I can't contact her by email. But, sorry, not under exemption. Technically, under, under Castle, I can't contact her by email. This exemption says, I have one email, one CM that I can send to Terry, one, where I'm exempted from getting consent. And I can say, but, and, and, and that, that allows me to contact her with one email. In that email, though, I have to <laughs> have specific requirements. I have to include the information and unsubscribe. I have to identify not only myself, but I also have to identify who referred me to her, which you would want to do anyways. But I would have to say, Jim has referred me to you because of da 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 da. And then I have to give her the opportunity to unsubscribe <laughs> through me, but also through him. So <laughs> if she called, sends him an email and says, Why are you give my email? I don't want to hear from her. Tell her not to contact me. Then he has to let me know, and I have to unsubscribe and take her off my email list. And if he doesn't, then he is violating Castle on Um if I, if I send another email. But bottom line is, if she doesn't respond to me at all, I can't send a, a follow-up email as well with only one exception. So the third-party referral would be a, a, something you would use more on a general basis. If you have third parties who are sending out electronic messages through you, you con contract with people. Often we do that, right? We get people through email blast for us, that kind of stuff. So that would be an example where they can send out um, so they can give you email, uh, an email address that they have contact with. You can contact them directly, but then they can answer, they have, you have to give them the opportunity to unsubscribe to them as well as So it's, it's very complicated and fairly uh, and, and not easy to implement. Um, quotes and estimates in response to our request, that's exempted from the consent, but has to, you still have to include the information and unsubscribe. Warranty recall of product safety information is exempted from consent, but you have to include the information and unsubscribe. And CEMs that deliver product or services, including updates and upgrades, are uh, um, uh, updates and upgrades. Actually, that shouldn't be there. It's that's for computer programs. But anyways, CEMs that deliver products or services are, excuse me, are exempted uh, from consent. But you still have to include the information and unsubscribe. As well, more CEMs that facilitate or confirm transactions. Someone donated to you. You send them back an email and say, confirming uh, the donation. That, that's you don't have to get consent to that. But you have to include the information and subscribe. And finally, CMs that provide factual information about ongoing subscriptions, memberships, accounts. Factual. Again, here's, here's the thing about factual. It has to be only about this stuff. So it can't be just general factual information. Only, so it's very, very specific about what you can and can't include if you don't want to get if you don't, without consent. Sorry, yeah. Uh, you, those, all these, all these. Uh, I hope, I don't know where Eli is, but I hope all of you will have access to these um, slides afterwards. Yeah, he's got it. He's got it. So you'll have all of that. Is that hard copy? Or uh, I, I don't know if Eli has hard copy, but certainly you'll have access to it and you can download it. I, I'm, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, unfortunately, we don't, I don't know if that Eli brought Eli, do we have hard copies? No. No, but we'll have it online. But I'm happy to put it back up. And we can print from it online. You can. We, have, we don't have a lot of time. So I'm just going to go quickly over to preparing for Castle, and then I'm going to give my little preparation for Castle uh, input, and then I'm going to hand it over to Jim. So here's, here's uh, what I've done for you. I've done a flowchart. It is a basic recap slash um, stepping stone uh, flowchart where it just gives you a sort of overview of how you need to think about the process of implementing Castle. Um, and then because of the lack of space, it just sort of recaps all what we talked about. So, so if you want to get the specific information, go back up to what we talked about the earlier slides. But here's how we, how I think you need to sort of start thinking about it. So the first thing you got to do is ask yourself, do you send CX? <clears throat> if the answer to that is no, which is unlikely, uh, no further action required. You can go on your way, your merry way. But I seriously doubt that's the, you know, if you're if you're if you're involved in some form of commercial activity in any way possible, uh, you will uh, fall on, you will be sending at some point CX. 
Yes, most likely. The next question you have to ask yourself is, are you a registered charity? If the answer to that is yes, you may be exempt, you may, from complying with CASEL, but only if your CEMs are sent for the primary purpose of raising funds. So what does that mean? It means that all, not all your CEMs will be exempt, but some of them might be. The answer, if you are not a registered charity or you want to apply, talk to think about your other type of CMs, you have to ask yourself these questions. Are you exempt under any one of the other exemptions? And on the box on the, on the left, sorry, on your left, on the left, do other exemptions apply? You can, those are some of the examples we talked about earlier. If the answer to any of those is yes, oh, no further action required, don't have to do anything. If the answer to, if you fall into any one of those examples on the right, so you don't have to get consent to send their CM, you can send it, but you still have to include the information and the unsubscribe. If the answer to any of these exemptions is no, or you're not sure if you fall into any of the exemptions, the next question you have to ask yourself is, do you have implied consent? Okay, is consent implied to send a CM? So, very, again, very brief recap of the exist not non-business relationship exemption, and this is just a brief recap. Um, you ask yourself, first of all, are you a registered charity or a nonprofit? And is the recipient, has, has the recipient been a donor or volunteer or a member of yours in the past two years? Okay. This is after July 1st, 2014. Okay. This is not unrelated to the transition period. If the answer to that is yes, great. You have implied consent to send that CM. You can send, send. But it's only good for two years. Okay, so keep that in mind. And you still have to include the, the information on the unsubscribe. If someone unsubscribes, you have to implement it. And keep track of those two years. Make sure you keep track of two years. And obtain express consent before the end of two years are over. Okay, get that express consent because once you do, it's good forever until it's withdrawn. If the answer is no or you're unsure whether you have applied consent, before July 1st, you don't have a lot of time, recommending, this is a rec just general recommendation, and again, Jim will get into it in more detail, is that you obtain express consent from anyone who doesn't fall into any, who does, you don't, for whom we don't have implied consent, and for people you have implied consent with too, because it's a much better uh, approach. <laughs> and you include, start working about including in the prescribed information and unsubscribe in all your CMs. That's what you've got to start working on. You don't have to have it before July 1st, but start working on that, okay? Um, after July 1st, 2014, Obtain consent in prescribed form. What does that mean? Don't send out a CM asking, an electronic message asking for consent for people who you don't have applied consent. Don't do that. Okay? Find other ways. Prescribed forms. Examples are have it on your website. Someone can go to your website, click here to get your emails. Someone donates to you at that point as part of the donation. You know, you can say if you want to click, you know, get consent. at the same time that they donate, you can ask them to give you um, give you consent. Pick up the phone and call them. Um, get it in writing in a, like actual writing like at, a, at an event, that kind of stuff. So don't just send an email asking for consent. And don't forget to include the prescribed information and subscribe on all your CMs after July 1st, 2014. All right, and on to the IT part of things. So that's, that's basically the general legal, legal way of thinking about it. So it's about, I'm reading that right, about 20 after 7, so I'm going to go through this in as timely a way as I can. Yeah. Um, basically what we're looking at here is the two different systems, the CRM and the email system. Um, the database will contain your constituent information. It stores all of your relationships and transactional details, like your volunteers, your membership, their last donation date, um, what you've sent them, did they open it, that type of thing. And it's where you're going to keep your express consent or prove your implied consent, and that's not there. Um, the email system, it processes the self-serve unsubscribes, so usually the click here links. Um, filters the email deployment against the opt-out list. There's usually some kind of blacklist that your email system has in it that is the final say in, in who's not going to get your emails. And um, sends the email and contact information to the CRM. Um, sometimes it's automated, sometimes you have to do queries, sometimes, but you'll have some kind of business rule and business process in place to move the, the email information back and forth. Um, this is a shortened version of, of the flowchart, and everything's color-coded, so the green goes to the CRM, and the blue goes to uh, the email system. I'm going to let you find this in the deck when you see it. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then I'm going I'm to go to the, the process that, that we go through. Um, a suggestion, there are a lot of steps to remember. You can kind of tell that um, with what's going on. 
Um, build a solid systematic approach. Work some business, develop business rules that best apply to your organization. Um, it makes it easier, encourage, it encourages compliance, and it allows for effective process monitoring. It also allows to prove that you had the intent to comply with CASEL. So in the long run, you have your processes and systems in place, and when somebody comes and says, I got this email and I shouldn't have, you can say, we have done all of this to try and ensure that this never happens. And hopefully it'll stand up. So the recommended process, plan and deployment, create the email lists, filter the lists, which send the email, process the opt-outs, 10 days, report on the success, so go back, see what worked, what didn't work, and apply it to the next time you plan your next deployment of the same type of email. Um, again, blue and green. The top, the top three, the reporting on the success, the plan and deployment, and the create the email list, all are pretty much housed in most people's database or their CRM. The, the filtering the list, the sending the emails, and the processing the opt-outs are in the email system. Um, some integrated, there are integrated systems that will handle both. Um, it's everything's, as you can tell, there's a lot of things that are going to be specific to your, your system processes and your business processes. So some of the stuff that I'm saying will be in the CRM and some of the stuff I'm saying that will be in your email system may not necessarily apply depending on the email system you're using. Sometimes you build your lists in one and the other. But you want to have one fallback system that has the answers to all of the questions that you can have. So the first one, plan deployment. Planning out your emails is the first step. Um, you want to identify the clear goal in the message. It's really important that, you're receive, that people receiving your email know why they're being sent the email and what the purpose of the email is. Um, when, is it, when the email is being sent, are there critical groups that you need to establish consent for? As in, do you have consent with them? Are you going to use implied consent? So basically, you'll have two groups. You'll have the implied consent group and you'll have the, the um, express consent and you'll need to be able to prove that for both groups. And can you get... explicit consent for the ones that you, you need it for. Um, and again, continuous improvement. Can you take what you've learned from your last one in your planning? Um, building your email lists through your database and CRM. So you've tracked all of this information. You have it all there. And hopefully you've, over time, started to build queries and, and ways to query the database that will better give you what you need for each type. It's best to build base queries that comply with CASEL so that you're consistent Consistency is the key. Consistent in what you're pulling. Um, the, uh, the filter the list. Filtering the list, kind of I mentioned that, that black list that it's going to sit out in one of your systems. It's going to remove everybody at the last minute. This usually sits in the email system. It also will catch those last minute ones that haven't come into the system. And we were talking about, somebody mentioned about how often are you pulling lists. Um, I design your lists before as far before as you can is when you're working with your, your annual, annual gift people, your major gift people, whoever's designing and giving you the requirements for the, for the list. But just before you go, just before you move it and send it, you really should pull it one last time and then let your email system take those last minute exceptions out. Um, again, 10 days, you should, whichever is gonna be your system of truth, that should be updated every, every 10 days. So work that into your processes. Um, sending your email message. So now it's time to design it. Well, hopefully you've taken some time and you've built some templates beforehand that are Castle compliant and have all of the opt-outs that you need, all of the unsubscribe mechanisms. Um, best describe what you're doing so you have a, a newsletter template that, that has all of the requirements and email type templates that'll have all of the requirements. Um, Phone numbers, email addresses, um, many it's gone over what the requirements for those are. Valid for at least 60 days. Um, unsubscribe mechanism, preferably automatic. That way you don't have to worry about that 10-day window with the full-on unsubscribes. Um, as you notice, I prefer the web address to give your constituents the best way to choose how they want to be contacted. Um, Opt-out or the full unsubscribe is there because it has to be. Hopefully you can manage your... your constituent base to tell you what they really want. Um, you send it, hopefully you'll get a few only a few unsubscribes back, and you process those within 10 days. 
make a system that, that takes the preferences and moves them back into your CRM. Um, <coughs> what worked? What didn't work? Did you reach your goals? How did that, how are you reporting back to the people who you need to report back to? And that's the end of the, oops. And that's the end of the cycle. Uh, Jim, that was fast. I know. <laughs> sorry, I didn't leave Jim a lot of time. I'm sorry, Jim. That's why I try to keep questions to the end. Um, but Jim will be taking questions. Questions. Yeah, I'll be around. Sure. And I think basically the idea, you know, the whole point of that is, I mean, that kind of, I think I covered a lot of it, which is essentially you got to have a process in place. And Jim, basically, what uh, Jim does is help you put that process in place and making sure that you um, keep track of everything. So, castle tips and I'm going to talk again a little bit about CASEL compliance tips in addition to just general process of getting consent and, and implementing it. Here are a few things you really should need to uh, start uh, doing right now. First of all, <clears throat> get your board on board. Uh, decisions respecting CASEL must form part, of, should form part actually, should form part of your uh, overall risk management strategies, okay, because frankly there's a lot of risk involved in CASEL if you don't comply, uh, and decisions need to come from the top. Uh, <clears throat> at board and executive levels, and if you don't get any buy-in, as the CRTC says, held out about the personal liability for directors and officers. Sometimes I get, oh, DNO insurance, don't worry. I don't, know, I don't know if that insurance will cover the directors and officers, so they need to keep that in mind. Um, anyways, just make sure that some, there's, there's buy-in, because otherwise, you know, some, I, I see some, you know, organizations where someone, and, you know, they, it's the IT person that's tasked with this, and they just, and it's just so overwhelming that they just can't really make decisions about what do we want to do? Do we want to rely on the exemption? Do we want to rely, or do we want to just get a blank consent, express consent? I mean, these are the kind of things that you need to get um, your board and executive uh, aware of, involved in. Conduct an audit. So that's the first sort of more of a on hands uh, approach to how you have to process this. And it, it's the beginning of what, uh, the, the, the preamble to what Jim just talked about. You basically got to sit down and create an inventory of all your messages that your organization sends and identify the audience that you reach out to. Um, that's what Jim covered very, very quickly. But that's basically it. Try to think through your entire business cycle. Like you said, you may be surprised how much is actually sent. Actually, that's pretty much for you, Jim, to talk about. And, and you got to audit each message and audience for castle compliance. Have they opted in? Uh, did you get implied? Do you have implied consent? Have they opted out? Did messages contain requisite information? So that's the kind of stuff you have to think about. Go through your list, um, your CRM list, your email list, um, and, and that's and, and, and start working through your list. Obtain consent. Uh, we talked about this already in the beginning, right? You need consent. While you don't have to get express consent from everybody, it's the safest way to do it, right? Because once you have it. Don't have to keep track of it unless they opt out. And once they opt out, they opt out. Right? <clears throat> Develop a castle compliance policy. So what's that about? You got other compliance policies in place, I'm sure. Some of them have to do with your employee compliance, has to do with your social media, perhaps with your privacy legislation. You gotta include a castle compliance policy in your policies. And so many policies in place. That's very important. Why is it important? Because under Castle, you, there is what is called the due diligence defense. And what it says is basically, which made Jim very quickly, briefly reviewed it, uh, that it's if you have a compliance policy in place that is reasonable, and what, what, it, what it reasonable means is tailored to your organization. It's not just based on some template you pulled off the web. Uh, and so you, it shows that you have thought through the process, you implemented it, and you, you, you actually tried to put it in place and, Fly with Castle, and that particular complaint that came at you sometime in the future was based on some glitch, some email that went wrong, some person that misunderstood, some employee that clicked said, whatever it is. That was a one off thing. And if you can show that, and you can show that you have a, a reasonable compliance policy in place, then you have a due diligence defense, and that is a, um, an absolute defense. It means it can't be found uh, liable under Castle. Uh, 
And some of the examples that I, I talk about for compliance, reasonable compliance policies, which I work with clients and as well, as well we work with clients on putting that together, is uh, procedures for maintaining, uh, requesting, maintaining, and utilizing consent. We talked about that. Tracking implied consent, acting on a subscribe request. So how do you, what type of procedures do you have in place? You also should have compliance policies and procedures in place for third parties. What does that mean? Someone is communicating on your behalf. For example, uh, they're sometimes referred to as email service providers. Um, what's the name of one of them? Uh, Monkey? Yeah. Mailchimp. 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 Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I've, been, I've been up since 5 in the morning today. So. Yeah, Mailchimp. Uh, so that's an example. So someone is sending an e-blast on, on your behalf. Okay, you need to make sure that they are complying with CASA, that they have consent from the people who are receiving those emails, and the consent is for to receive emails from you, not necessarily from them. Okay. And you need to include that in your contracts with those third parties, as well as indemnification clauses, which basically say if they don't comply, then they'll indemnify you in the event of liability. Trained staff and volunteers, and if necessary, contractors, again, that's the third parties. But it's very important, once you have the reasonable reasonable compliance policy in place, it's all good and fine if no one knows about it. So you got to train you know, the board, but also and the executive managers, but also your staff, new hires, volunteers, you got to train them, you got to have a training process, set up a bit, some people go over, I'm like, well, you know what, I do this, you know, as you can see, I do it, I set up today in three hours, because we're really going through it carefully, but you can just set up a meeting, a one hour meeting where you take people through, here's what we're going to do to make sure that we comply with CASA, this is our process, make sure they are aware of it. Ensure that third parties are aware of it and they're complying as well. Get help. It's not so easy to comply with Castle, um, and uh, and it's it's co it's complicated. So you know, well, I find a lot of people are trying to do it on their own, and that's okay. Often you need some help. So certainly get help from legal counsel. Get help from IT, IT consultants as well as you know internal, external, whatever it is. Get help if you need to. Final notes. Okay, so, because um, we don't have a lot of time and we really want to get to your questions, I'm just going to very, very, very briefly go through the other uh, uh, provisions of CASA. Remember, I mentioned at the beginning, it's not just CMs. There are other things. Uh, some of the examples of the things that are being um, uh, regulated by CASA are the installation of computer programs without consent. What that, what that says, very briefly, is that you cannot install a computer program, which is basically any type of program software, app, any type of code, on a computer device, which is basically anything, in Canada, anything, I mean, like, you know, it could be a Barbie doll or a car, um, in Canada, without the express consent of the person who owns that particular device, controls it, yes? Does that include cookies? Okay. Cookies? Good question. Cookies are one of the ones that are actually... There are a particular type, because I, 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 I don't have time today to cover it, I'm happy I can give a whole talk about the installation of computer programs. Trust me. All right, so the, the, while there's no implied consent for computer programs, there are a few type of programs that have, you, you are, have assumed consent. I don't know how different that is from implied consent. But one of the, luckily, one of them is cookies. However, however, <laughs> it, that also, it's not a blank type of, uh, of uh, Exemption for cookies, it's only in particular circumstances if it's reasonable to conclude that the person installing it would have consented to it. <laughs> I don't know what that means. That's basically, I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what it says. So you have consent for cookies under a castle, but it's got to be reasonable. That's what it says. Now, why I'm not dealing with computer programs very much right now is because that comes into force on January 15, 2015. So there's a little more time. Happy to give another talk about computer programs, but not right now. Um, but that's that's basically the recap of computer programs, and that sort of, that goes to the whole issue of consent because often you know people go very common. Someone goes to your website, you install a cookie on their on their on their, uh, and actually it's, this goes to the next next step, next the next thing that it covers. You install a cookies on the a cookie on their browser, so now you know they've gone to you. You know you can go to them, you can send them emails. You probably have harvested their email address now harvested their email address and they weren't aware of it and they didn't consent to that, that's another part of Castle that you're at that point violating. So you've got to be careful about that. And so if you're going to do that, you've got to get consent to, to harvest, to act to get their email address without their consent. You have to get consent. 
uh, and uh, and you have to disclose that you're doing that. Okay, so they can't it can't be done without their awareness, without their knowledge. That's another example. Um, unauthorized collection of personal information online. Uh, interestingly enough, they were talk Someone was uh, I can't remember if it was CRTC or Industry Canada was asked whether personal information and address harvesting includes IP addresses. And initially, some one of them had said, I think it was a CRTC, no, they don't, or maybe it was Industry Canada, they don't consider it to be IP addresses, to include IP addresses, because a lot of people get, collect IP addresses, right? Um, but Supreme Court of Canada decision that came out very, very, very recently, the, the, well, the privacy decision, on uh, it was a, from a criminal perspective, but still, had considered an IP address to be a personal information. So how is that going to apply, we don't know, but that decision came out about two days ago, actually. Maybe a few days ago, and so, yeah, it's it's so who knows how where how far that's going to go, but again, don't have time to cover that right now. All I got to say is you got to be aware if you, you can't collect that information without the person's knowledge. But you are if you're complying with the privacy legislation, you should be okay. You got to disclose that. That's all you have to do. And and misleading advertising and marketing in any electronic format, that's again something you shouldn't be doing in any event. How can we help? Right. Well, here's a list of stuff that we can do to help you. If you need it, anytime, contact us. And for questions, there's um, Jim's email, my email, and my Twitter feed. I post my uh, um, stuff on Castle as often as I can. The reason I just want to let you know that, because I mentioned I had left my firm recently, I still don't have a business card put together. I'm still, it's still being worked at, so there's no business cards. But if you want to contact me, there is my email right there, and you have my consent to do that. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to be taking questions. Um, Jim as well. Uh, yes, you, you have your hand up first. Yes. So, my question was So, I work with a bunch of um, non profit companies who are providing things like the gateway and things like that. So I'm sorry, can you speak up a bit? So, the, I work with a lot of organizations who are uh, like community activities and have more than gateway and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how does, how does this legislation? It affects them in the same way as it affects everybody else. And more importantly, they're not exempted because they don't fall into any of those categories. So they would affect anyone else. That legislation, legislation, Castle affects pretty much everybody in Canada, you know, everyone. So, unfortunately, if they're not a registered charity, they won't have that exemption to rely on. If they're not a non-profit organization, as that definition, I mentioned that definition, and they don't have members, they can't rely on the applied consent, they'll just have to get consent. And once they, sorry, one last question, once they have consent, they send a Yeah, you got consent. But don't forget, sending out that email asking for consent can't be done after July 1st, 2014. So you got to do it now. Yes? So I have a few questions. Yeah. So the first one, uh, you mentioned that there's a Again, this is something I'm mis I'm misunder that is again the thinking. It's a very common thinking. I hear that all the time. It's very common because it's really kind of based on what we're used to under the privacy legislation, which is an opt-out regime. When you say if you ask for consent and no one responds, that's implied consent. That is an opt-out way of thinking because what you're doing is well, if they didn't say they don't want to receive anything, they must really want something. No, under Castle, they have to say yes, send me something, or you don't have consent. Okay. You don't have consent. You don't have expressed consent. Implied consent is not because they haven't said don't. They haven't said don't send me anything. Implied consent is because you have that existing relationship with them. Okay. So, but I have two years. So two years. Right. Three years in this case for traditional. So, period. so then my emails that are if I take a loan for this money. Mm -hmm. No. If it's not a commercial electronic message, okay. yes, you don't need consent. But if you have a little link in there that says, yeah. click here to find out more yeah, about what we do, and then what you do is collect money, then you're pro it's probably a CM. 
And here's again what I'm going to get back to in the beginning when I said about newsletters. My, my recommendation is don't assume your newsletter is not a CFO, because it might be, even so, if you don't think it is. So here's a strange question. Uh, okay. So not, we, not a bit of strange. We sent our request to send out today for our ATM. I have my ATM on Saturday, and we're probably going to change the name. Right. So, oh, that's a good point. Uh -huh. So what does that mean? I'm going to send it again. If it's, by the time it's registered for the society's office, Right. Okay. So you you're registered. You're the, you you sorry. You're changing your name, but you're still the same organization. Yeah, I'm still a registered chair. Right. You're same. You're, you're the exact same organization. It's not. It's not like you are incorporating a new organization. If you've changed your name, that's a good question. I, mean, I really have to. I can't answer it right now because I'm going to have to give it some thought. Yeah. If, but you're the same organization, and you're you're probably okay because it's if you're the same. It's a, it's the same person. It's the same or this is just to change the name to rebranding. I don't think that's a problem. But but that's very, very general. I don't want to I'm gonna have to Maybe look specific to you. Uh, you can contact me for specific questions and I'm happy to follow up with anyone. Sorry, specific I can't give specific answers right now because I gotta listen. Weird. So um, one of the things just I, yeah, okay. So if my fundraiser clones some of my sponsors from my last year's fundraiser and says we sponsors Say, say that again, sorry? My fundraiser phones my sponsors from our last right. fundraiser. It says, okay, we're doing fundraiser right. next year. Will you sponsor us? Can I send you some mail? Yeah, okay. No yeah. Problem. That's not a problem because it's on the phone. So I can just go to mail. Mail? Mail or phone? Yes. Canada Post. Canada Post, Canada Post has cut down on their, yeah. on their, they should, they should start, uh, yeah. they're going to make some money. I, I, from when, when this came into force, I said, oh, Canada Post okay. is going to have fun okay. with this, you know? All right, um, yes. I'm sorry, some people okay. don't have their hands on. I was allowed. Yeah, you got you had it for a while, but I'm going to get to everybody. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, question in regards to content requirements. For what? Sorry? Content requirements. Okay. Uh, do they apply to sign up forms on the website as well? Let's say I have a uh, sign up form to an email newsletter. Right. Do I have to um, have the uh, information and subscribe? Address, yeah, and not to prep, probably not, but at least the address, the phone number. On that page as well, or is it enough to just have the input field and? Well, I think okay. Well, here's the thing. Castle only deals with the CM, so that's not a CM, right? So under Castle, that wouldn't be a requirement, yep. under the CEM requirement. But under privacy legislation, you probably should be you know, uh, uh, identifying yourself. And in any event, it's a good it's a good practice to identify yourself, right? Yeah. You don't want to. People are not going to give you consent if they don't know who you are. But at, that, at least the Castle only deals with the information requirements in a CEM. Yes. Might actually go to that as well when you get double locked in. So people fill in the form on the website, right. send, send, and then they get an email. Right. You know, we, we, we still send them that email? Yeah, it's con confirming something, right? First of all, you're allowed to, you have, you're exempted for something that confirms something. But once they give you the answers, once they consent it, at that point you have to put them whatever you want. Okay. Right? Um, yes, yeah, you had a question. Yes, um, you were mentioning that companies' internal email is not exempt from right. this. Even though the companies own that email, so like my work email address, despite the fact that it's got my name in it, isn't it isn't my personal email right. address. So if somebody sends me an email internally, like my coworker right. Sue, um, are you is what you said that they are violating this legislation both individually and as an organization? Yeah, that's that's how it's done. If they even though it's owned by the company. It, it, it's, it's not about the ownership, it's about, again, it's about communication, so it's about the person that sent it, all right? So they're not sending it on behalf of the organization, they're sending it on their own behalf okay. for something other than the business of the organization, and under Castle is not exempted. Yes, yes. So emails about Rothy's and Gallup's and Bloomberg's and Yahoo's and Yahoo's and Yahoo's and Yahoo's and Yahoo's and Yahoo's and those are CNs. Right. If you want to rely on the exemption for those type of yeah. emails, you have to make sure yeah. that it's clear that that's what you're doing. That you're you're asking, you're selling the tickets for. Proceeds of that. Yeah, yeah, well, you don't even have to say the proceeds, but right. you're selling tickets to a raffle for the benefit for whatever the charity it is. Now it's pretty clear that your your primary purpose is raising funds. But if it's at the bottom after you've done something else, right. so it has to do with the wording of your email. So yeah. it has nothing to do with the exchange of money, really. It's about. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, yeah. That's my that's my interpretation, and that's what I got from Imagine Canada's. They're probably talking about what Imagine Canada said about what raising funds is, what industry Canada yeah. said. But you know, how is the raising funds going to be actually interpreted by the courts and the CRTC when it gets there? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. someone else. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like I have my question, but the first one is just to clarify something that we're going back and forth on. Right. If before now or two now or even in the future, someone goes to our website and says yes to a new time. Yeah, that's express consent. That is express consent. That's so express I very much most people when they say, oh, my new list, I mean, anyone who's already signed up and you know they signed up via, via the website, all of this are already yeah. express consent. Yeah. Right? So if we, they so consented people, to receive it, they consented are, to receive it. Full, yeah. So some people, this depending on how they've managed it, right. I may mean, already be 100. percent Yeah, consensus. as exactly. long as you can prove, prove they've said yes, well, right. and you have a date, and you have a date stamp on it. Right. You need good. to you need to keep track of it. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you already have it, great, you're in a good place. And frankly, if you go back and you filter your list, like Tim, like Jim talked about, you will find that it comes down to a certain number of people that you don't know where you got any from. And if you don't know, then you got you got to deal with those. Yeah, um, so yeah, yeah. My, question, my other question, um, my actual question was, okay, so we work with, with clients right. and we provide services. In some cases, it's one-to-one -one actual services right. uh, with an express relationship. In some cases, it's more like a day day you know, service group, like a program group, right. and then you want to do a lot. Um, in most cases, we are initially getting, we're actually getting that written consent already, but assuming we did, right. are those clients considered a Business or a, a Are they paying for the service? No, because we're, we're being funded by right. uh, Immigration Canada. I, uh, I get it. It's, you know, it's a contract thing, right? right. You're coming in as a, as a, as a say, here's your three month program, and you're coming in every, every day or every week. But is there a contract with them for your services? Um, well, we don't, I mean, it's not a contract contract. But we, well, we have a contract on behalf of industry. Right. Here's, 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 I, here, uh, this is the thing. I, it's not the first time I got that question. And frankly, it's one of those anomalies and the pro not anomalies. There's many issues with Castle and problems with Castle. But under that particular implied consent relationship, the business relationship, it's going to be questionable whether it falls under if you're, if you're giving a service for free. I find it very concerning. Um, I mean, most of what we do, I mean, most of our funding, that's what we do. Right. We're right. But here, here's an example, and, and, and the reason I'm going to say is because probably there's more people in, in this particular room who have that issue. I'm just going to go to that, um, uh, the implied consent uh, slide and show you, uh, where is it, uh, there it is. Okay, so existing business relationship, the way it's defined is if you've purchased, leased, bartered a product, someone has purchased, leased, bartered a good product or service from you in a percentage. So if they've done it, if you've given it for free, they haven't purchased, leased, or bartered it from you. That's the problem. So it doesn't fall under that. Accepted a business investment or gaming opportunity, that's not the case. If you're giving them services. Or a written contract, a written contract has crea is created or had existed between them. So if you have a written contract with them, okay, right? But if you don't, if you're giving the service for free to them, technically you don't have a five consent under this particular type of business of relationship. I know, it makes no sense. Wow. But that's how the business, that's if you look at the wording of the legislation, that's how it's written. So you don't, you don't, know, you don't know, have any sense of how it's going to be all Get implied consent, well, there's going to be many ways to deal with it. You can just get, first of all, get express consent every time they enter into a service with you. They register with you, right? So they can get them to fill out a form and say we're giving you consent, right? Okay. Um, there could be, you know, you gotta look at your bylaws. They may be considered members under the nonprofit organization members membership implied consent because of the very broad definition of membership. So they, they may fall under that. But if they don't, I would just not assume I have implied consent from them. All right. Uh, yes, yes. Got a weird scenario for you. Uh, our website was hacked a few months ago. Malware was planted on the site. The site uh, malware's purpose was to collect private information. Yeah, that's that's one, of the, one of the reasons this, this legislation is coming in. Of course, they're trying to avoid that happening. Yeah, yeah so, go ahead. but we took it down, got right. rid of it as soon as possible. Right. But they got through during, during that 24 hours. Right. So if your question is, will you be liable? Yeah. Under Castle, you wouldn't be. And Castle only goes after the violation. And Castle, one of the reasons that Castle is meant to patty pass, that's where they're trying to go after. They're trying to go after that. That's really what they're 
supposed to be tried about after, which is the hackers and the scammers and the malware. The installation of computer programs, that's the intent of it, is to deal with this kind of situation. But the way it's drafted, at least I remember looking at it when I got a similar question, so it's meant to go after the violators, the people who have stolen the emails. If you have, if you're, you're essentially a victim of that. You're in fact a victim under the installation of computer program. So you wouldn't be. Yeah. I don't really want to sound like a bad person, but I actually do have really good policies in place. But okay. this is a vital part of the Process, yes, right? it's it's driven okay, by. So if I've though. never had any spam reports on my email send out um, Mailchimp or whatever, then chances are it's going to be okay. Well, like, there hasn't been any spam legislation enforcing Canada before. There hasn't been any. Right, no, but like, all my all my email program people can market spam if they think it's spam. Right. It goes. It's right. recorded. Right, because that's because that's a that's a U.S. type um, yeah. like, that's a U.S. type legislation. It's based on the U.S. legislation where it's an, it's, it's an opt-out, so if you click spam. True. But if that doesn't happen, it's not going to happen. And again, keep, it, keep in mind that there hasn't been a spam requirement under um, uh, spam, spam legislation in, in Canada. And more importantly, you're, if you don't comply, you're in violation of a law that has very significant consequences. That is an example of a decision that has to be made at the highest level because it's a risk management decision, right? And it, I mean, it, 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 I'm not saying it's a bad person. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, it makes more sense to have a compliance policy because it's all you need is one complaint. And if you have nothing in place, then you have no defense. If you have something in place that makes sense, it doesn't have to be all the way. It has to be like obviously tailored to your resources, right? And what you can and can't do. And it, it sounds very daunting when you look at it, but really when you sit down and I sit with people and I sit down and when you go through their list, they realize it's not as bad as they actually, it actually comes down to. Because you really just, you already have some process in place that keeps track of things, right? So, yes? The attorney is sending out messages to ask for donations of things. Like yes. Songs. Yes. So that's not raising money, right? It's a good question. <laughs> good question. It, it, the way the wording is raising funds, right? Now, I'm trying to remember what Imagine Canada said about that. Again, they, they based on what Industry Canada told them. I think, I think they said that it applies to donation of stuff as well, but... I think that becomes as in-kind Yeah, in-kind falls, falls under. Yeah, it falls under fundraising, and I'm pretty yeah. sure it's funded. But here's the problem. You're right. The wording is not fundraising. The word is raising funds. Will it be interpreted as something... I think it probably would because it just makes sense, right? You're raising something, you're getting something, so it's not a money, it's something else. I think it would be okay, but I don't know. I don't know. So it's especially because they also say barter a product. Yeah. So they are the Yeah, they, they, the legislation is very badly worded. I don't know. <laughs> and the reason I don't know is because so I, I just, I wouldn't assume. Again, I say, why try to rely on the exemption? It's too narrow. Get consent. It's so much easier, yeah. right? Yes. Verify something you said about social media. Social media, yeah. Direct messaging, specifically yeah. Twitter, direct messaging. Right. LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Earlier part of the conversation, I thought you had mentioned that it would be considered a C, and then later I thought you had said it wasn't considered a C. Yeah. Okay, yeah. right, I'll be Where clear. Do you stand on that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can only say what the CRTC has said, right? Because frankly, again, it's very difficult to figure it out. Um, it's complicated. What the CRTC has said, and I technically agree with it based on the, I guess I can, based on just the very black and white interpretation of the app. Again, this act was written probably before, I mean, social media was in place, but I don't think we thought of it. Is that this, a CM is a message sent to an electronic address. That's what, how it's defined, okay? So the CRTC said that if you post something on someone's wall, for example, okay, or on on a Twitter feed, right? You post or a status update or something like that. It's not, and it doesn't go to an external or even an internal electronic address, then it's not a CEM. Okay? But once it actually goes to an electronic address, like for example, to someone that, you know, you get a LinkedIn email message that goes to your email, to uh, your email account, for example, at that point it is a CEM. That's what, that's what the CRTC has said, and that's just based on the very kind of like, narrow-minded way of the legislation is worded, it would be, it would fight. Yeah. So, I'm afraid I have to be the jerk here, because we are coming up on 8 o'clock really quickly. Um, so, if 
if you can stay around for a little bit, yeah, we'll be doing some cleanup. So uh, I'll, you know, there's a little lobby over here for some further questions. But I think at this point we've got time for one very quick question, and then we're going to have to yeah, go I, in I here. Can, I can never say no. I know. <laughs> all right. So uh, who here? Who's Someone who first time. Asked first time. Uh, this, this lady here, she put her hand up. Perfect. Thank time. you. I, I, I ask, and then the other thing is, well, we will stick around for a little while. And I, I know I will to answer some questions. And you have our email account, so you can at least me. I know, and I'm sure yep. Jim take questions. Send us emails. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. So I have two questions, and it will be very quick. We, okay. we are a registered nonprofit charity, yeah, sure. and we have a social enterprise. And I believe like all this legislation will be applied to our social enterprise. What's a social enterprise? What do you and mean by it's that? It is a three foot thing. Body. Okay, yes, okay, yes. Okay. In that yes, case, it would apply. Yeah. It's purely in that case, commercial. how we collect this information is we call shop at our store right. and we collect the your email address. You gotta be very careful with that. So, yeah, this Very is, careful with that. And so, that's a bad practice. You gotta stop that. I would just stop it. Or if you could not stop it, get consent. What does that mean? If you're gonna give me the email address, you gotta have the people who are working at your store tell them the following things. We are asking you for your email because we want to send you electronic messages and you can withdraw your messages at any time. You got to meet those requirements, have them to actually fill them. So maybe if you want to give them a little yeah. more form yeah. to fill out, that's good. But just, but you know how sometimes you buy something, you go to a store and you buy something, you say, do we have your email address? Sure. Da, 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 da. And then you use that to send people email addresses. That would violate Castle. That's, that is a bit, that's one of the things they're trying to stop. Okay. Perhaps. So make sure if you want to do that, get them to fill out a form. Where they give you an email address, it says on the form in black and white, we are asking for an email address because we want to send you, in order to send you, by signing here, you're agreed for us to send you electronic messages in the future. And you may withdraw your message at any time. Okay? So if, if they do that, be, uh, make sure that you keep track of that form, put it in your system, etc. And the second question will be probably interest, like, interesting for everyone. No, but I think it's a about for press everybody. releases. Yes. Like, oh, press yeah. releases. Okay, I guess so, that's what yeah. like media contacts, I just collect yeah. them through my research, right. and I don't have data consent, and I can't have data consent. Right. Okay. So what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm signed. I get that message, that question every time. Okay. Press releases. You've already kind of talked basically through it. If, if the email address of the journalist that you are contacting has been published publicly it's on their website, for example, then you can send them a press release under the implied consent, the first one, where it says if they publish their email and it, it, it relates to their business, and the press release relates to their business because they're a journalist, you can send. But if you got that email address and it's not anywhere public, you got it in any other way, someone gave it to you, or you bought the list, some people, marketers buy lists, that kind of stuff, you, you wouldn't have consent under Castle, so you would have to get consent. So I would call the person and say, can I send you my press release, call the organization and say, can I send press releases to your, to your journalist, that kind of stuff. You gotta be careful with that. Yeah. But that's only if the press release is to money. Oh no, obviously, again, the press release has to be a CM. I mean, that's a question, but sometimes it is. I mean, maybe you're, you're marketing yourself. You can get a press release to market you. That doesn't even talk about money, but you're marketing, but you're marketing yourself because you, you're marketing something that would be commercial, okay? If I send, if I send a, a press release, for example, about Castle, to a journalist, I'm doing it for one purpose. I want to promote myself, right? And I'm promoting myself because I want to make money. At that point, that would be a, that would be a CA. Yeah. yeah, this is an example. So if, yeah. for example, just really briefly, we send them out saying, you know, this policy that the government put forward in is such as cancel, sucks. But that would, that would Oh, yeah, 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 that's just, that's just an opinion, right? That's fine, that's not a CA. Yeah. Yeah, you can say that. And trust me, I, 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 we, have to, we have to stop you. You know, I, you know, I, I understand. Yeah. Well, anyway, call, send me emails. Happy to answer them. <laughs>